Testing audio to the live feed. This is an audio test. Audio test to the live feed. This is Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees meeting. Today's date is May 25th, 2022. Audio test, this is an audio test to the live stream. Checking audio to the live stream, this is Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees meeting. Board of Trustees meeting, today's date is May 25th, 2022. May 25th, 2022.
Yes, we hear you. Trustee Malalu, do you hear us?
All right. Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to call the meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. If we can have a quiet in the chamber. Good afternoon and welcome to the Long Beach Community College Board of Trustees regular meeting for May 25th, 2022. We're calling this meeting to order at 4.34 p.m. Um, I want to ask Board Secretary Reese to take a roll call of the trustees. Virginia Baxter. Here. Herlinda Chico. Present. Vivian Malaulu. Trustee Malaulu, can you hear us? She's yes, here, here. Can you guys hear me? Here. Yes. There we go. We hear you now. Uduak Joe Intuck. Present. Sunny Zia. Here. All right. All the trustees are here. Uh, moving to item 1.3, public comments and closed session agenda items. This is an opportunity for the public to give three minutes of uh, comments with a, a maximum amount of 20 minutes per subject. I know we do have a number of comments today and uh, I think we'll get through them and if we need to, we can do a time extension if we uh, go beyond the 20 minutes. Um, I have a, a set of them here. I'm gonna start with first um, Donna R. Coates and then next will be uh, Sunday Dominguez. Is Donna here? I've just been handed many of these, so it's the first time I'm seeing them, so forgive me if I stumble. Dear board president, members of the board, and guests, I feel honored to work at Long Beach City College. I have found compassionate, hardworking, and dedicated staff in all corners of the campus. It pains me to know that many of them are having difficulty paying their rent, never mind saving to buy a home. It pains me to think they are not able to save for college for their children. It pains me to think they're living paycheck to paycheck. I don't have to tell you about the rising cost of food. You and your family also feel this at the checkout stand. I don't have to tell you about the unreachable goal of homeownership. Your family and children may also complain about it. I don't have to tell you about paying off student loans. You and your loved ones may have carried this burden as well. I also don't have to tell you that the increased money spent on gasoline is being diverted from savings, rainy day funds, vacation plans, and children's college accounts. Support LBC classified employees by allowing them to keep up with inflation and rewarding them for a job well done during these trying times. Attract qualified candidates to fill LBCC openings by offering competitive salaries for classified staff. Thank you for listening. We are currently living through historical times, COVID, war in Ukraine, and the highest inflation since 1981. But in 1981, the average rent in Long Beach was $250, and the average salary was $21,000. Average rents here are now $2,500, but salaries are not $210,000. They average here $50,000. Property managers want you to show three times rent to qualify. That's almost $7,600 a month or $91,000 a year to rent. Food is up 9.54%, also the highest increase since 1981. Right now, California has the nation's third highest cost of living. COLA is 6.56%. California's transportation costs are the second highest in the country, due in part to over $6 per gallon gas prices. The living wage for a family of four in California is $110,000. Anyone here make that? Not me. It is no surprise that California has the highest rate of homelessness in the nation. What is a surprise is that we have staff here who are homeless. Yes, you heard that right. Homeless on their LBCC salary, which has not kept up with COLA or inflation. I'm one of the lucky ones. I have two spare bedrooms in my home that I rent out. There is no way I could live in Long Beach and pay my basic living expenses on the salary I receive here at the college. Recently, I tried to refinance my mortgage. I have no debt and a FICO of over 800 but the lender could not figure out how I paid my current mortgage on my salary. March 2020, with just a brief notification, classified were told to go home, work from home, with very little planning and no idea how to do it. But we did it. We adjusted and kept the school machine running in spite of the huge obstacles we had to overcome. We helped our students, our teachers, and in some areas, our administrators, and of course, each other. 
We attended online Adobe classes, learned Zoom, Canvas, how to connect to our desktops remotely while suffering power outages and slow Wi-Fi connections. When someone found an easier way to do something, we shared that information. When someone was having a mental breakdown, we helped as much as we could or pointing them in the right direction. We lost friends, family members to COVID. Many of us are still ill with long-term COVID health issues. But still, we kept on working. We keep on working now. The students, the teachers, everyone needed us, and we were determined to find ways to keep the college going. If we didn't do our job, if we didn't keep our little link in the chain, it would all fall apart. So we did, and we still do, and we deserve to be given a fair California living wage. I am a classified employee in Enrollment Services Department. As a department, we are required to always be open because of the critical nature of our presence in serving students with enrollment and financial aid issues. Throughout the pandemic, we served students on phone, email, and virtual platforms continuously, and were among the first to return in person for the students. In the Student Services Vice President Budget Report, it indicated that admissions and records was voted as the highest ranking department in student satisfaction for access in fall 2020. Uh, Don, it's been three minutes, thank you. Thank you. We'll next go to our next speaker, Sunny Dominguez. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent President Munoz, Vice Presidents, and those in attendance today. My name is Sunny Dominguez, and I'm here to speak about the current AFT negotiations happening with the district. I'm a divorced single mother who rents a house in Long Beach for my two children and myself. We also have two dogs and two cats. Two weeks ago, the home I rent was sold to new ownership. My biggest concern right now is that I will most likely be required to move out. Because of that concern, I have proactively looking, been looking for a house to rent. Unfortunately, I have been unsuccessful in finding anything even remotely within my current budget that would accommodate my family and pets. This Monday, I received a letter in the mail stating that the rent would be raised starting July 1st. I may have to move my children away from their schools and community and live quite a distance from the college in order to find something affordable. I have been at the college for 11 and a half years. The only way I can get a raise now is through these negotiations or wait every five years for longevity. Five years. That is another three and a half years for me. With the rising cost of food, gas, utilities, clothing, pet food, along with everything else, it is getting increasingly harder to be able to support my family. When I started working here in 2010, the minimum wage was $8 for the student employees. Minimum wage is currently $15 and will rise to $15.50 in January. This means that the hourly rate for student workers has almost doubled in the time that I've been here. My salary has not. As a classified employee who has received Classified Employee of the Year, as well as other awards, who has served on both the Senate and Union in order to be a part of the process, I, along with all of the other classified professionals, should be rewarded financially for the way that we were able to quickly pivot and work online and make sure we were able to serve our students. I am shocked that the district would be unwilling to, pack, to back up all the praise we receive from all of you with a fair monetary adjustment, adjustment. We should be able to at least afford the basic necessities to live. It is a shame when those of us who are directly and indirectly supporting the students so they can achieve their academic and professional goals, cannot afford the essentials in life to support ourselves and our families. How are classified professionals supposed to keep an upbeat and positive attitude while helping students, all the while facing such an incredible financial strain? The next time there is a crisis like the COVID pandemic, how do classified professionals stay motivated to step up to the challenge again when they remember how they were slapped in the face with minimal to no offering in terms of a reasonable raise? While at work, we are not only faced with contracting COVID while working, but also the possibility of an active shooter on campus. I know one classified employee who checks for active shooters and snipers every morning when she arrives at work. 
All, we all want to have a culture of care, but shouldn't that start with the district, showing the employees who give their all every day that they matter as well? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Kathy Doyles. Kathy? Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, board President, Superintendent, President Munoz, and all the other board members and guests that are here. I did receive quite a few. Um, I'm talking on behalf of our, my other colleagues today uh, who couldn't be here tonight for one reason or another. And so I'm speaking for them. So I'll, I'll get through these as fast as I can. But I really want to share this with you because it's super important. Glasses. Dear Board President, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Munoz and Administration, employee morale is very low. The classification and compensation study is still going on for five years. Longtime employees are leaving Long Beach City College and obtaining better positions with other districts. Classified are among the lowest paid employees at the college. The good news is that you have the ability to help address these problems. Please come to the negotiation table with offers you'd want to receive yourself. Please allow us to maintain a hybrid work schedule. Please allow us, oh sorry, many of you were former classified employees. Please reflect back and think about what it would be like if you were still in that position. Our well-being and future is the hand in your hands and we are depending on all of you to make the right decisions. Please take care of your Viking classified family. This is a personal story from another colleague. Dear Board of Trustees, I live in a family of three in Area 1. My husband and I had a humble beginning. We were a young family who had the hope of staying in Long Beach to prosper and eventually become financially stable if we did just the right thing. We graduated from Wilson High School, earned associate for transfer degrees from Long Beach City College, and bachelor degrees from CSULB. Throughout this time that we were in college, we received CalWORKs, financial aid, public housing assistance, LIHEAP, to keep our water bills and lights on in our home, and food stamps to stay alive in Long Beach. Now that I'm part of the Long Beach City College classified staff in an entry-level position, I came in proud and ready to work for Long Beach City College. I no longer receive welfare to support my family. However, inflation and our cost of living has increased significantly. And even after earning a degree, bear with me, from Long Beach City College and working for the college, we may be back in Section 8 housing. The Long Beach Housing Authority guidelines indicate that a family of three with a combined income of $53,000 falls under a very low income level, and even 80,000 is considered low income. We have a great fear of going backward. With this letter, I beg you to do the right thing. Please grant us our proposal for increased pay to stay alive and to restore our dignity. And may I read Thank one you. more, or no? That's, you're over three minutes time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate your time. Next, we'll have Jimmy Flowers, followed by Suzanne Englehart. Well, members of the board, uh, definitely uh, great to see everyone. President Munoz, uh, uh, members of the community, I had a muster strength just to be here. Um, when yesterday's events happened, Honestly, I woke up, it was very difficult to get out of bed. But I made a commitment to my employees to be here. I didn't even have time to get a shirt, and you know, I just uh, felt like, you know what, I need to push through and do the right thing. I think that's the mindset of a classified employee. We're gonna always push through, and we're gonna always do the right thing. You know, we're gonna always be committed, creative, enthusiastic, hard working and reliable. 
Um, so like I said, um, I didn't come with a lot of words. Um, and I realized sometimes you got to say what you got to say in life. And um, I will finish this off by, you know what? You guys deserve a raise, you know, because you've done a great job. And I got to say this as well. And people may get mad, but I need to say what I need to say. Um, you know what? Uh, thoughts and prayers sometimes is not enough. Um, it doesn't really do much. It doesn't really solve much. It helps us. And um, if you know someone that's having issues and there's uh, weapons in the home, please contact someone. I mean, we got to do something about it. And like I said, this wasn't what I planned on saying, but I got to say it. Um, thanks for everybody's time. Next will be Suzanne, and then followed by Blanca Galicia. Good evening, Board President, Trustee Uduak, Joe and Tuck, Superintendent President Mike Munoz, and other disting distinguished members of tonight's meeting. Thank you for extending the time allowed to hear public comment for item 1.8. It truly shows you value the views and opinions of the employees of LBCC. As we, the Faculty Association, engage in activities to support our negotiations team, it is our goal and objective to do so with dignity and respect. As you have heard from our faculty during public comment and emails, I trust you have witnessed and noted the quality and professionalism of the faculty working for Long Beach City College. You as trustees can be proud to say you oversee some of the finest employees in the community college system of California. With this in mind, and before you go into closed session this evening, I want to address the situation that occurred the other day. It was brought to my attention that specific board members were mentioned as not supporting our request for a double-digit raise. This is not the message the Faculty Association wanted to send to the community. We do not know how you vote individually in closed session. We will only know how you voted collectively at the bargaining table tomorrow. Our negotiations team have been and continue to bargain in good faith and our faculty continue to share their stories and reasons why the Board of Trustees should provide the Faculty Association members a just and substantial raise. Therefore, prior to going into closed session, please accept my personal apology for the miscommunication. And with the remaining time, I just want to show uh, solidarity with uh, my brothers and sisters in AFT and CHI as uh, all employees of Long Beach City College. So, thank you. And if I am going to ask, can I yield my minute and 11 seconds to my colleague that did not get a finish for? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had a lot of them. I love it. Oh, where was I? Classified staff is constantly referred to as the backbone of this college. We often are told that our efforts are appreciated and that the college would not function without us. We all go above and beyond, and why should the only recognition of this be words? If our efforts are truly appreciated, show us by giving us the cost of living adjustment that will enable us to continue to sufficiently provide for our families during these unprecedented times. The annual inflation rate in the U.S. has increased to over 8%, and the effects of this increase has been monumental. The minimum income needed have greatly increased, while our salaries have not risen at all. Our classified employees are forced to restrict food purchases and consumption, restrict transportation, and limit the use of utilities. This is having a negative effect on our daily lives, including decreased financial stability, job satisfaction, our health, and morale. Thank you. Blanca is next, followed by Yolanda Padilla. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Administration. My name is Blanca Galicia. I have been here at LBCC 20 years as a counselor, and I'm here representing counseling faculty and students. Counseling faculty are requesting your support for equitable contract language 
to instruction, which would allow the equal opportunity for counselors to counsel students online and remotely for 50% of our load. This semester, our schedules were split between on-campus and remote, and remote work, 50% each. Students requested more online and phone appointments versus in-person appointments. And therefore, our schedules for in-person appointments were changed to online and phone to meet students' needs. Students first. The Spring 22 data shows that students booked 1,042 counseling appointments in person versus 6,935 online and phone counseling appointments. And they showed. The data show, strongly supports that students prefer to be counseled online or by phone. Thus, we would like the contract language to reflect the opportunity to remote counseling services in the future. In general, in general counseling, um, we conducted a survey during the fall 21 and spring 22 semesters, asking students for their counseling modality preference. Out of 402 completed surveys, 328 students reported preference for online or phone appointments, and only 74 students reported preference for in-person appointments. This is 81% versus 18%. Remote counseling services is a priority for students, and they very much appreciate it. Students can meet us at home early before they go to work, during their lunch work, in between online classes, or at home while watching their children without the added time and expense that it would take them to come to campus. Pre-pandemic, online counseling had been offered for years, and counselors were meeting students 100% remotely not on campus. All counselors are now fully trained in various modalities and platforms to provide remote services successfully. Many students are asking me in my counseling appointments for online course courses for both summer and fall 22. Online classes and online counseling service may attract more students, not only local, but outside students outside of our area out of the state and international students and leads to an increase in FTE. Students feel safe and COVID cases may be minimized. Please support equitable contract language to us counseling services. Thank you for your time. Thank you, next is Yolanda followed by Dr. Frank Perez. hearing myself and nobody else was. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Board of Trustees Administration. My name is Yolanda Padilla. I'm a counselor representing the counseling department and member of the EOPS program. I've been a counselor at Long Beach City College for 25 years. The counseling faculty is requesting your support and approval of the same contract language given to instruction of faculty, which would allow the equal opportunity for counselors to counsel students online remotely for 50% of our load. In the spring of 2019, I chose to train to do online counseling and joined the group of LBCC counselors doing online counseling at LBCC. After my training, I was not able to do online counseling because of all types of issues I had to be ironed out by managers in my area. The Connex training online was intense and required nine weeks of training be, uh, to become certified. I wanted to convince my department to offer online services for our EOPS students. I was tired of seeing how my students who are required to see me three times a semester take two to three buses to come and see me. Many of my EOPS care students had to arrange babysitting or miss work to make counseling appointments with me. Who would have guessed that a pandemic will hit and I along with the counseling faculty would provide online counseling through training and cafe. The use of online services has helped us with retention and enrollment in the EOPS program, as it shows in our counseling show-up rate and completed at plans. Our counseling show-up rate for spring 2022 only, as of today, is 
fall 2021-22, fall semester in us up to today is 85%. In 2021, our show up rate was 82%. Completed ed plans, spring 2022, as of today, is 1,161 ed plans. Fall 2021, spring to 22, as of today, is 2,548. In 2020, we had 2,263 ed plans. In 2019-2020, it was 1,734. I'm here today to urge you to support 50% of our counseling load remotely. We have been able to serve students that otherwise would not have been able to attend college. For example, Chester, computer science major, chronically ill student, able to attend college and complete his computer science degree and take online courses and Zoom with me. Uh, Leanne, LVN student, who was featured on The Guardian, who is able to live in Inglewood in a youth housing facility sponsored by Hovenis and completing her nursing degree at LVC. Leslie, disabled student not able to take courses on campus because of an autoimmune disease, now enrolled and participating in the DSS program and EOPS. Brandon attending LVCC from Norco after relocating to live with his parents after the pandemic, left them unemployed and transferring to Long Beach, City, uh, to Long Beach State as a recreational studies major. And a multitude of students that I personally counseled that stayed with families in Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Oregon, Russia, who moved back to their families temporarily due to their pandemic and were able to stay enrolled at LVCC. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is, next is Dr. Perez, followed by Alexandre Hostel Shea. Hello again, board. Uh, thank you again for making time for us, and uh, thank you again to Superintendent. Um, uh, sorry. A little sleep deprived with my uh, little one at home and I'm here again to speak with you uh, on behalf of all of my uh, faculty and staff. Uh, I'm, you know, sad that, um, you know, now in my son's seven weeks of life, I'm still without uh, a contract and, and unsure of what our economic future is. And as we speak today, uh, it is more concerning that our classified staff are not being supported as well as they are, as was mentioned, the backbone of the college. And so um, I'm going to keep my comments brief to this, but um, you know, in the time that I've been here and in the time that I've uh, come to know this campus very well, uh, I've seen uh, many of our colleagues, classified and faculty, go above and beyond on many, 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 many occasions to do so much, um, including all of the Fantastic Four who are my colleagues um, in their first year sitting on multiple hiring committees, uh, being a part of the breadth of this college and trying to encourage its support and growth. and. Um, I leave you with this thought like last time, right? Um, we believe in you and we, sh we want you to show you or we want you to show us that you believe in us by giving us a fair contract and by giving us a living wage. Thank you. Next is Alejandra, followed by Andre Calderwood. Or Andrea Calderwood, sorry. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name is Alex Hatlestad Shea. I'm a professor in the Communication Studies Department and a very proud member of this college. I know several of you, and it's, it's lovely to see you. Uh, first off, I would like to express uh, my personal gratitude to the board, to President Munoz, to our VPs. I recognize and we recognize all the hard work and dedication that you have and that you're, you're putting into this college, and we thank you. Uh, we know it's not been easy, and it's greatly appreciated. Now, in the same regard, we also know that you value the hard work, the dedication, and the time that your faculty uh, is devoting to the students and to the campus at large. We know that you see that. The challenge is expressing and articulating the work that we're doing. It's hard to measure. It's hard to witness the countless hours of everything we're doing for this campus and for 
our students. The learning environment has changed. It's grown beyond the physical walls of this campus. And likewise, the needs of the students are now well beyond straight academic instruction. To meet these demands, uh, we've created online, robust classrooms that educate, that engage, that communicate to a much larger and more diverse audience than we've ever had before. As we gradually move beyond the pandemic and all of the issues that the world is unfortunately dealing with, the campus, our classrooms, and our faculty will be ready for any challenge that comes our way. That's our duty and our obligation to you. Inside of the classroom, our role as educators has expanded. Beyond being once just content providers and giving our lessons in our respective fields, we have become case managers. We have become guidance counselors. We have become distributors of vast and vital resources to all of our students in need. And lastly, we've become a friendly face for our students to talk to in their desperate times of need. So when you look at this sea of red right here, please understand the dedication and the devotion that they are providing to you, to our students, and to this campus. And when this meeting ends, their work is just starting. So your recognition and support for these countless efforts can be expressed by approving our proposed COLA. Your faculty have earned it, and it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Next will be Andrea, followed by Candice Dickerson. Hello, my name is Andrea Calderwood, and I teach full-time in LBCC's music department and direct the vocal jazz program. I'm here to express my support for a salary and compensation increase for full-time faculty and staff that's in line with and beyond the state-issued cost of living. As faculty are putting more effort than ever into supporting student success as a result of the ongoing disruption stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic, moving music courses to online and hybrid was to stop the bleeding. It took round-the-clock effort that included new training, recording, mixing, one-on-one -on -one phone calls, and a complete rebuild of what it even means to teach music. Now that we are hybrid or partially in person, students lack the strength and fundamentals and need more and more of our time. We have continued to make recordings, meet privately, and create supplemental materials to help students stay afloat. Additionally, We've written grants and gotten funding in our spare time in order for students without computers, printers, headphones, microphones, pianos, etc., just to stay in class, even now as we're hybrid. This change has taken place primarily in our homes as the G building has been closed and we have moved into portables. We are working in reduced closed quarters on campus as we are at home. Noise has required us to work outside in hallways, bathrooms, cars, and even late at night when there aren't construction or garden noising, noises to interrupt music, sight reading, and training rhythms. To add to that, music teachers are at a greater risk for catching COVID as many of our courses require forced air directed at us while teaching choir, band, etc. We go the extra mile. We sing and play into our phones and laptops in our cars to help create the opportunity for students to just exist in this new mode. We sought funding from charitable organizations to get the funds to attend festivals as we now needed more rooms to prevent students from sharing exposure. The Ella Fitzgerald Foundation bought music students equipment like headphones, keyboards, printers, computers, microphones, pianos, guitars, etc. And we also raised funds to feed them on outdoor trips or concerts as well. And this has all been on our time. Additionally, we responded to the call for equity and social justice by adding a rewritten course to cover the music of multicultural America, focusing on non-colonistic points of view. This is on top of everything besides concerts, festivals, celebrating on-campus things like 
a new building, affinity group, history months, or graduation coming up next week. Our students are already co connected to emotion in the arts. They are burnt out and operating on trauma brain chemistry. I can't count the times I stayed until 10 or 11 o'clock at night helping a student find emergency help, had phone calls or office time with students in tears. Faculty like myself have taken extensive trainings to prepare ourselves to serve our students and get them through crisis after crisis. My grandfather was a public school music teacher with a lesser degree, a bachelor's degree, and he taught his whole career in Southern California public schools and eventually in juvenile hall systems. He retired comfortably and continued to sub, but he had a stay-at-home spouse, four children, bought a new house, added on, added a pool, bought cars, investment property, and retired comfortably, but continued to serve as a sub when he before he passed in at 82 years old. Thank with you. a fully paid off house, savings, and property. Contrast that with my family. My husband is in his 20th year of teaching elementary school in LAUSD, Thank and this you. is it's my time. fifth full time year after 10 years of adjuncting at three schools. We can barely make rent after going to public schools that were previously free for other generations, and we're not asking for enough money to thrive, we're just asking to survive. I thank you for your time, as I know you love and work for the school as much as we do. Thank you. Next is uh, Michael Morgan. And that's our final speaker card we have. Did you see Ken Stickerson? Oh, that wasn't, sorry, yes. <laughs> I, th I got my, uh, my number. So we have two more cards, okay. Candace and... <laughs> Uh, Hi, my name is Candace Morales Dickerson, and I teach here at Long Beach City College in the Reading and Teacher Prep Department. I write to express my support for salary compensation increase for full-time faculty in line and beyond the state-issued COLA. Faculty are putting more effort than ever into supporting student success as a result of ongoing uh, disruptions stemming from COVID pandemic. Since 2020, faculty have been operating as business as usual and then some. Faculty have been grinding more now than ever with nothing more than a thank you for your efforts. Grind culture, as one of my beloved colleagues phrased it, has taken over Long Beach City College. We continue to take on more and more because we're asked to, and we want our students to succeed. But no one seems to be thinking about how much extra work we're being asked to do and how much exhaustion we're experiencing because of it. More now than ever, and I am not alone, I practice intrusive com communication through different communication modalities with my students. I've adapted my weekly modules to meet the needs of online, hybrid, and face-to-face -face classes. I've included more faculty professional development to learn best practices to meet the needs of my students in different course modalities. I meet with students face-to-face -face and on Zoom outside of my office hours to accommodate different schedules. I grade more, I contribute to my department more, I contribute to campus-wide communities more and meet students' mental and emotional needs beyond what my education and training have prepared me for. Moreover, this extra labor comes at the co context of the most severe inflation since the 80s. Anything less than COLA could demoralize faculty and compromise student success at Long Beach City College. Please, please make us a good faith offer that accounts for the labor we do for the students and for the college. Thank you. Thank you, and Michael will be the last speaker. Good evening, board, and uh, all my classified and faculty staff. My name is Michael Morgan, Sr. I've been working for LBCC for 16 and a half years in the facilities department as a custodian. And I just want to reiterate some of the things that my fellow classified and faculty staff have said. No one was prepared for what happened the last two and a half years almost with COVID. Um, a lot of people were afraid. I know a lot of us were afraid because we had to be on the front line and be here working under conditions that at the time seemed to change every week um, as far as infections and so forth. So we didn't know, but we still steadied the course and we still stayed here and we still did what we were asked to do to maintain at this college. Now, I'm 59 years old. I don't think, and hopefully I won't be here 
uh, if we ever have another one. This one's not over yet, but I'm just saying, the things that we were asked to do may never be asked again if we never have another pandemic. It was a lot of work that we had to do. And as far as fair compensation raise, I don't think what the union and faculty are asking is a whole lot to ask for. When you consider, I'll give you an example, just the other day I went to Walmart, I got uh, washing, uh, washing powder, I got uh, deodorant, and I got mouthwash and toothpaste. Typically that would be about maybe $20, $21. That was $51 just for that. And as far as gas, we're sitting at almost $6 on average, and everyone here doesn't have a house, so rent is quadrupled. So, I, I, I mean, unless you guys haven't been watching the news, what we're asking for is not really a lot. Those are the three basic necessities just to survive. Getting to work, having a place to live, and food to eat to take care of your family. And with all the things that we have been asked to do, you, you guys have no idea of the things that we've done over the last two years and are still doing. And every time I check emails, there's always a COVID infection here, COVID infection there. The numbers are going up, there's new variants. So we don't know when this is gonna be over with. So I don't think what we're asking for is a lot. We're not asking for anything but the basic necessities just to survive. And like I say, I've enjoyed my time working at this college, and I hope you guys will consider everything that not only myself, but all my other colleagues have said, because this is difficult times, and no one expected this to happen. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for the public comments on the closed session agenda items. We're gonna adjourn now the closed session. We should be back in approximately 10 minutes at 5.30. So we'll see you then. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. We're going to reconvene the meeting. I've asked everybody, please uh, take your seat. We're going to reconvene the meeting. Thank you. We are restarting the regular meeting of the Long Beach Community College Board of Trustees. Uh, it was May 25th meeting. It is now approximately uh, 5.45 that we're starting. Uh, we're going to go back into calling the meeting to order. And we're going to go to the Pledge of Allegiance to begin the open session. Um, what I'd like to ask one of our student trustee, or uh, sorry, one of our students to, to help us. Um, Alex in the white sweater, would you be able to come to the mic and lead us in Pledge of Allegiance tonight? Thank you. There you go. Ask everyone, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're going to start with our land acknowledgement tonight. Um, Long Beach City College acknowledges our presence on the tradi traditional ancestral lands of the Gabrielino Tabunga peoples. This land remains unceded territory. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. Long Beach City College honors and respects the Gabrielino Tabunga ancestors and their connection to this land. Secretary Reese, can we have a roll call? Virginia Baxter. Here. Herlinda Chico. Present. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Present. Udawakcho Intec. Present. Sunny Zia. Here. And student trustee Blackman. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum of the board. Moving to item 2.5, report of closed session items. We have no reportable action from our closed session agenda items, and we will have a second closed session at the end of the regular meeting. Moving to the public comments on agenda items, this is an opportunity where the public has three minutes uh, to allot it per speaker to talk uh, up to 20 minutes per subject. And we do have two public comment cards, and I'll give it to Vice President Chico. Thank you. Uh, the first speaker will be Karen Roberts. I'm Karen Roberts, part-time faculty, speaking on academic personnel. Good evening, President, Superintendent, Board of Trustees, and guests. Recently, it was related to me that a board uh, trustee attending a meeting of full-time faculty asked what they thought about the class action lawsuit brought against the district by Chai. Responded that all Chai needed to do was show up at the bargaining table and things could be worked out. Well, here's the truth of the matter. Since 2008, Chai has been negotiating consistently for better pay and working conditions and losing ground. For those who are unaware, LBCC part-time faculty are only paid for the time they teach. I know when I'm hired to teach a three-unit course here, I'll be paid for 54 instructional hours total. I will earn about $4,000 for one course. That's $800 a month without benefits. Prepping a course, writing a syllabus, getting materials on Canvas, grading and meeting with students are done without pay. Asking employees to work for free is illegal. In 2010, the district cut the pay of part-time faculty teaching non-credit classes by 15%. That has never been restored. In 2019, Chai proposed the district pay each part-time uh, faculty $4 a semester for a three-unit class. Cheap, right? It was the last ditch effort following several proposals the district turned down. So where does this leave us? If you were trying to achieve being the district with the worst compensation for adjuncts in the area, you've succeeded. Long Beach City College used to try to stay ahead of or comparable to Cerritos College. Forget comparisons to North Orange and Coast, both of whom recently passed full COLA through to faculty, by the way. Now Cerritos has surpassed us too. Their part-time faculty are paid at least 10% more on every step and column of their pay scale. They're paid for office hours to attend department meetings and reimbursed for $1,000 for medical expenses per semester when teaching a 40% load. Recently, Sarah Rokia and I were invited to speak to the LA County Democratic Party Labor Committee, who were appalled 
because several of them had supported you as trustees, believing you were pro-labor, only to find out you were not. The hundreds of part-time faculty teaching at LBCC, like the thousands of part-timers teaching throughout the state, are tasked with carrying out the mission of the chancellor's office. This statement is from their website. California's community colleges are at the forefront in combating income inequality and are trailblazers in supporting social and economic mobility. But you really aren't trailblazers, are you? You can only pretend to support economic mobility for students as you exploit a large group of your employees. It's time to stop pretending and do the right thing. Take responsibility for being complicit in a system that doesn't practice equity, have the political will and courage to be an actual trailblazer. Thank you. Our next speaker, I'm sorry, my glasses. <clears throat> next speaker is uh, Saya Rokea. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I did fine, I answer, I answer to everything, just don't call me late for dinner. Um, hi everyone, my name is Saya Rokea. It's nice to see some of you I know. Um, so I'm here today speaking on academic personnel. I am a Long Beach City College alumni. I've been teaching here since 2015, and I'm not a confrontational person at all, but I am an advocate. So I'm here today to advocate for my fellow part-timers by voicing my concerns about the federally funded COLA. As you know, the state released 6.56% COLA increase. We did not get the 5.07% increase this semester like I did in another district where I teach, and I don't know if we're going to be getting the 6.56% this, this next upcoming semester. So I am here today to ask, what is, the, what is Long Beach City College going to be doing with that 12% COLA increase that the government has provided? Thank you. Thank you. That um, was our last uh, public comment. <clears throat> so we will move on to 2.7, the approval of the minutes. Uh, so the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve the minutes of the April 27, 2022 regular board meeting um, as submitted. Is so moved. Second. Great. Um, and we don't have to take a roll call anymore, so we can just vote. Oh, well, if there's no objections on minutes, then... All those um, in favor? Thanks. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Perfect. Thank you. So we'll move to item 2.8, Resolution of Asian Pacific Islander Desi Heritage Month. Um, Superintendent President M Munoz, are you going to um, start with this? Thank you. So before the board, we have a resolution honoring Asian Pacific Islander Desi Heritage Month. The attachment is attached and the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 0525-22C, recognizing Asian Pacific Islander Desi Heritage Month as submitted. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So the motion passes. Do we do the presentation yeah. now? Yes, so we have the presentation of the certificate, and I do believe we have some members of our um, employee resource group that represent our Asian Pacific Islander and DESI group. So if we can invite them to the front, that would be we great. can go down and take some photos.
style game. I need to step it up. Uh, Dario, can anybody hear me? <laughs> we can hear you, Trustee Malaulu. Yes, Vivian, go ahead. Thank you, Vice President Chico. I just want to congratulate the group and uh, really commend them on the extraordinary calendar that they put together, celebrating Asian Pacific Islander Desi, the Heritage Month. Um, really impressive lineup. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there. Um, I had committed to attending multiple events this week and last week, and uh, life just took a crazy turn of events, and I had to uh, flake, basically renege on attending these wonderful events, and I'm so sorry to have done that because I even planned on bringing some community members to some of them. So just congratulations, and I'm so sorry that I can't be there, and um, of course I'm there in spirit, and uh, really thrilling to be able to see you all standing there and taking that photograph. I look forward to this program and the celebration growing each year. And just, uh, you are really doing something special for a student population that has often gone unnoticed and uncelebrated. So on behalf of those students and the members of the community, I would really like to thank you for that. Thank you, Trustee Malaulu. Anyone else? Okay. I'll see you all on Friday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will now go on to our next presentation, which is uh, 2.9, Resolution Jewish American Heritage Month. So the recommendation, recommended action is that the Board of Trustees adopt Resolution 052522B, recognizing Jewish American Heritage Month as submitted. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. I, I think we have discussion before the vote. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, then is there any discussion? Yes, I just want to thank the community members, um, my members of the community, the, uh, our leaders in the Jewish community, uh, for coming on such short notice. We have Cantor, Kelly Cooper, Perler, and David Alpern with Democrats for Israel. I'm really honored that you're here. We have a lot of folks mentioned here, but given the short notice, um, some of them couldn't contort the schedule to be here. So I really appreciate you being here. Kelly and I went through um, Alpert New Leaders Program and um, Jewish Leadership together, and she's a very revered, on, on, awesome uh, leader in our community. I'm so proud of you, Kelly, and thank you for being here and making time tonight. I appreciate you both. And I will vote yes on this item, Vice President Chico. Thank you. Any other comments? So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? So the motion passes. Um, who will be receiving the proclamation? Perfect. So we'll all take a picture down here. We'll meet you down there.
So we'll now move on to item 2.1, student recognition, Jack Kent Cook scholarship recipient. Uh, Dr. Munoz uh, will introduce um, our LBCC student. Yes, thank you, Vice President Chico. So at this time, if we can have our amazing student, Ulises Maldonado, is he here with us today? Ulises? Hi, Ulises, yes. <laughs> Ulises, if you wanna maybe come over to the podium, I'm gonna just say a few words before we recognize you. Um, Ulises Maldonado was one of 100 students selected to receive the prestigious tw um, 2022 Jack Kent Cook Undergraduate Transfer Scholarship. And so let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> I also had the privilege of personally calling Ulises to tell him the great news. This high this highly competitive national scholarship will provide up to $55,000 per year toward tuition, living expenses, books, and required fees to complete his bachelor's degree. Additionally, Cook scholars receive educational advising, invitation to campus-wide and regional activities, and are eligible for internships and graduate school funding from the foundation. We are so proud of you, Ulysses. I also want to acknowledge that we also had another Long Beach City College student who was a semi-finalist, and again, this is a huge accomplish as well, accomplishment as well, and that is Inoa Lua. Inoa Lua, would you please stand? We want to also recognize you. I have to say, I had the privilege of having lunch with Inoa today at the Bistro, and we had a wonderful conversation, and I really, it, it really was an honor to spend time with you today, and we are very proud of you as well. So with that said, if we can, um, obviously we'd open up to the floor for, if any of the board members would like to, you know, say anything to Ulysses, but then we can take a photo with him. Trustee Baxter. I, I, thank you. Ulysses, I hope you realize how important this scholarship is. This is one of 100 in the entire country open to community college students. And so that means you have an incredible GPA, but you also have a tremendous amount of leadership and community service. And so uh, we, you are following the footsteps uh, of a lot of other students and I really congratulate you and I'd like to get to know you better because you must be an incredible person. Uh, Trustee Blackman. Yes, um, one congratulations to the both of you. Um, there's only 100 people who win this award, so the fact that we have the winner and a semi-finalist, um, that says something about what we're doing here at LBCC. So congratulations, Anulua. I've worked with you since JFly um, my first semester, so it's been an honor to see the growth that you've had. I know you're on to bigger and better things, so I just think this really says volumes for the, you know, what we're doing here at LBCC and how great our students really are. So congratulations, and I know you all are on to big things. And Ulysses, would you like to say a few words? Uh, Vice President Chico, I had my Oh, I'm hand. sorry, no, I didn't it's, see it's that. It's a little hard to see with the black glass. Yeah, I couldn't see. I just wanted to also commend you and congratulate you. Thanks for making us proud. It's amazing. And it's because of students like yourself and this amazing institution that we're here to serve. So congratulations, big mazel tov. And I can't wait to see your big accomplishments from here on out. Thank you. Ulysses, the floor is yours. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't. I don't really have anything planned because I wasn't really told I was going to be speaking. So I just want to thank you guys for acknowledging this. Uh, of course. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to say your name, but uh, I didn't get a reply to your email. But congratulations on being the semifinalist. That's very important as well. Uh, I also did notice that. Uh, Student trustee Richard said that he was a JFly alum. I was too, so I think that says something about JFly. I think it's a wonderful organization. And uh, if anyone is wanting to do JFly, I extremely recommend it. Uh, I want to also thank my professors and uh, the people who wrote the letters of recommendations for JFly and for the universities I applied to because without them, I wouldn't be able to, one, win the award, and two, be able to transfer to a prestigious university. Thank you. Ulises, do you want to share with us where you're transferring to? Uh, UCI. Oh, very good, very good. <laughs> okay. Excellent choice.
So I think we're going to come down here and take a photo. Thanks. So I think I want to table item 2.11 till next year. <laughs> um, so our next item is the recognition of our outgoing student trustee, Richard Blackman. So I haven't done an outgoing ceremony before, so what typically happens, Dr. Munoz? Sure, thank you, Vice President Chico. So at this time, it's a moment to kind of pause and acknowledge our amazing student trustee for an amazing almost two years of service serving in this capacity. Um, it is kind of the time of year where we, it's very kind of bittersweet where we say goodbye to our student trustee, Richard Blackman, and we receive a new student trustee um, at the next board meeting. And so again, it usually typically each board member takes a few moments to kind of just extend their appreciation and congratulations to Trustee Blackman, and then we conclude with a photo um, and a presentation of a certificate. Wonderful, who would like to start? Sure, I'll start. Thank you. Richard, I'm so proud of you. I, it's been such a, 
an extraordinary couple of years, and I can't um, say anybody else had to go through this kind of extenuating circumstances that you had to go through. I'm so proud of you for stepping up, for being a leader. Um, I think Vice President Chico said it best. Uh, I heard her, like, you're like a very adult trustee, and you carry yourself very well. I know you're going to make us proud in the community. You already are and carry our name and make, make sure that people know where you went to and make sure they know about your great leadership abilities and the contributions you make to everyone everywhere around you. Congratulations, I'm gonna miss you. I hope you stay in touch and I hope you'll come by and see us um, and visit. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Trustee Zia. Um, Trustee Baxter. Yes, thank you. Richard, uh, I've known a lot of student trustees over the years, and I have to say that you are within the 1% of the best that there are. You uh, have taken your responsibility very seriously. You're always prepared, you're at everything, uh, and you really have the interests of the students uh, at heart. And I uh, wish you the best in your future. I know you're gonna be a famous person, not that you're not already famous, but uh, that you're gonna really make us proud and. You'll come back and be in the Alumni Hall of Fame and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you have such tremendous potential, and we are fortunate that you chose to run for the office and got elected. So thank you. So, um, Richard, you've been just a, a tremendous representative for the college, and um, you know, you and I have been able to work together, I think the longest and the most uh, since I've been uh, a trustee. So we were kind of new together. Um, and everybody, everybody that, that we talk to, whether we're at a conference, whether we're out in the community, always comments on how exceptional our student trustee is. Every single time. I mean, to the point where they say, we have good student trustees in ASB president, but uh, we would really like yours. <laughs> uh, so you have set the bar very high. I love to see um, you grow out in the community. Um, I think that's the next step that I've seen is that you're now out in the community and you're really connecting with younger students and becoming a mentor. and. Your visibility is so important. It's so incredibly important to see a young black man uh, leading in, or being in a leadership role. Uh, and you've taken that leadership role and you've championed issues like uh, mental health and discussing mental health amongst you know, brown and black men. Um, culturally, those are things that we don't do and they're very, very sensitive topics that you've tackled. So I appreciate that. I had to get really technical because I got emotional for a second. <laughs> so I had to really start going technical. Um, but I just want to tell you how proud I am of you. Um, uh, you know, both, both my colleagues are right. That we're, we can't wait to see the great things that, are, that you're about to embark on. Glad to know that you're thinking about staying local um, because you are a gem and you fit perfect here in Long Beach. Uh, I don't want to send you back to the East Coast. We want you here. <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, you will be uh, still part of the family, and we will be in touch, and we will be working in the community, no doubt. So congratulations. Vice nice President Chico. Yes, Trustee Malaulu. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
Trustee Blackman, would you like to say a few words? Um, I think I'll save most of it for later, but I just want to say thank you. And, um, you know, everything that I think that I've been able to create here has been because of the opportunities that you all have presented with me. Um, it's because of the leadership that I think every single one of you have. I've been able to, you know, use that mentorship, um, the experience that you all have in the community and, you know, just kind of model that a little bit myself. Um, so everything that I think that I've been able to create has been because of every single one of you. Um, everyone on the dais, I think has, you know, some kind of way, shape or form um, helped me in that kind of way. So I'm just grateful, I'm thankful um, for everything that we've been able to accomplish, everything that I've been able to do here. Um, but yeah, I'll get more into it later, but just very thankful. So thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Um, if we can go down and take a photo and probably everybody on the dais since everybody had a part <laughs> in all of this, so let's go take a picture. And if um, ASB President Cross could also come join us. Is she picture. there? I was looking for, I didn't even see her. Okay, yes, please, come on up. <laughs> photo bomb. So our next item is reordering of the agenda, and it looks like if there are no objections, um, the Academic Senate has asked that item 9.1 be moved up to follow item 5.1. Are there any objections? See none? Hear none? You okay? Good. <laughs> so then we will move up. I, item 9.1 to follow item 5.1. We'll move on to standing reports. ASB president report. Ava. Thank you, board vice president. I'm nervous all over again like the first one. Oh. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I really don't know where to begin because this is my last board report. But um, first, I did want to congratulate the Jack Ken Cook Scholarship recipient, Ulysses. Incredible achievement. And this was the first time I'd heard that he was a part of JFly. And Enolua um, was my roommate in Sacramento when we were at the conference. So it was really exciting to see her here again. I know she left. But, um, and then um, before I get into the rest of my report, I feel like I just need to acknowledge that um, Anyways, just uh, it's so disappointing that I ended off my last board report 
with the mass shooting that had happened in Sacramento that luckily, you know, Richard and I managed to miss because we got back to the hotel in time. But um, just a school shooting at an elementary school. <laughs> just like, my goodness. I mean, there's been too many that have happened in the past month. I can't even number all of them. I know, like, Richard and I, when we were going over things before this meeting, we were just like, looking up the past however many that have happened this month, and like we can't even put a number to it. It's a ridiculous amount. 19 children dead, 21 dead total. <laughs> like, gun regulations need to be stricter. Um, what more does it take? Um, anyways, I, I would have felt terrible if I didn't say something about it today, so I just wanted to at least make some kind of statement about um, Robb Elementary School in Texas. But um, anyways, just because it is my last meeting, I, I do want to try to get in as much information as possible about the experiences that we've all had as students, what a year it's been. I was trying to reflect back on everything and realizing that Richard and I started a little bit early. We started over the summer, which I think is, tends to be atypical because everything starts, you know, with the fall semester, but given the push towards reopening the school, like, we started things up early. We were trying to get connected to everyone. I know um, Dr. Corral reached out to us, and we were part of the reopening task force committees, and that's where we really got to know everyone a little bit. I mean, it was, I think, three meetings a day, like, four days a week. I mean, these people saw plenty of us before the semester even started, and... I remember that we were around when, you know, there were, there were births, you know, people were getting new pets, and, you know, it's just like we got to see so much of, you know, these people's lives already just on Zoom and connect in an interesting way before the semester even started, and that was, I think, a huge support to Richard and I going into everything and being able to support you all as best as possible and the cabinet as best as possible because we got training over the summer. How lucky was that? That was an incredible gift in itself, despite, you know, the unprecedented times of it being the pandemic and, you know, that, that being the reason why we were all spending so much time together. But it really did make a difference to, I think, how exactly we tried to go about this position. And to the cabinet, I just, I, I'm so proud of my cabinet this past year, which, of course, Richard was on as well. But... Um, it was not necessarily, you know, a fun, happy camper year. I mean, we had a lot to get done, and a lot of it wasn't necessarily, you know, fun student events. We were remote a lot of the time. It was a lot of committees. It was a lot of hiring positions. It was a lot of legislature, and they hung in there. They hung in there through all of it, knowing that that's what we needed to do at the time in order to help students as best as we could. And, you know, the personal you know, relationship building with amongst us all could happen later, which has been incredible to see in the past couple weeks. There's been such a surge of in-person events, and it's been incredible to actually be face-to-face -face with the students for what really feels like the first time in this entire tenure in this position, and just how impactful that's been to see what was a whole year, essentially, of work behind the scenes, you know, behind screens, and then to finally come out in front of everybody and to see that it paid off. It paid off what everyone was doing, and I know you had to take a big chance on us, and it wasn't necessarily your choice because we were elected in by the students. But you took us under your wing and helped us make the best of the situation, and I have learned so much from you all. Like Richard was saying, everyone on the dais, um, I'm getting emotional now. Alex was also a part of the, um, the cabinet as well. But everyone behind the scenes, I mean, I, I hate taking pictures and being on film, but I know how hard everyone works, you know, running the cameras, taking the pictures. I look at things now because I know the work that was put into it, so much work everywhere, in front of the camera, behind the camera, behind the scenes, PR, everybody, so just... Thank you for giving me that perspective on how a college is run and how best to support the students. Thank you. Ava, if you have, if you have more to say, if there's no objections, 
I, we'd be happy to give you more time since this is your last report. I mean, th thank you. Mm -hmm. But I think Richard's going next, and I'm going to definitely get teary-eyed if I stay up here much longer. So let's just leave this all in time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you all. Really, thank you. Thank you so much. Three point two is the student trustee report, and I'll give that over to student trustee Blackman. Thank you, Vice President Chica. Um, good evening, everyone. I think, like President Cross, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up all the tragedies that have happened since our last board meeting. Million, you know, so many places that are supposed to be safe places for us. Um, the Buffalo shooting, you know, really affected me a lot because it's a grocery store where. You know, we go, we go to the grocery store. I cook a lot, so I go to the grocery store almost every day. Um, and, a, you know, a school, it's just, it's frightening, it's scary, it's sad, but it's these places that we're supposed to feel safe, you know, where it's like everything should be fine in these kind of places. Um, and I think it's just such a tragedy that this keeps happening. And just a reminder that, you know, for these safe places to do all that, that we can do, I think, you know, to make sure that our students stay safe. Um, and then also just that our students have a place to go to talk, you know, um, you know, I've been a huge advocate for mental health this whole time I've been here. So um, I think it's making sure we keep those services up because our students need it now more than ever, um, especially as we get through this pandemic. Um, today also marks the two-year anniversary of the George Floyd murder, um, which was a huge moment for me. Um, you know, that's essentially what got me here. Um, I didn't watch the video or anything like that because um, I'm tired of seeing those kind of things, but I knew that there was more I needed to do. Um, I didn't protest because I know that it's powerful. I know these things are powerful, but I'm just like, there's something more that I need to do. Um, so I enrolled at LBCC. You know, I said, I gotta get myself back in school. I need to get my education together. I need to do what I can do to fight these injustices. Um, you know, fight for what's right in a different kind of lens. Um, Protesting is important, all these things are very important, but there's gotta be people at the table who are keeping this energy going. I think that was the first moment we kind of saw, you know, people really acknowledging that Black Lives Matter um, and all those other kind of things. And um, living in Long Beach as well, you know, just kind of, that's what brought me to Long Beach City College. And I think seeing all things that happened during that summer, I, I enrolled for a summer one course. I said, I'm not wasting any more time, <laughs> you know? I need to get into this thing. Um, not to, you know, COVID as well too, but it was just like, that was what kind of got me here. So I think thinking about that being two years ago um, was just like an overwhelming feeling this morning as well. So um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about my time here at LBC. I said, I guess, you know, I started out in that summer. Um, I worked in student affairs through for my federal work study. And I think that's kind of what got me into, you know, being involved with everyone. Um, and I think from that moment, I was able to just work with Taylor Robertson, um, Kim, Dr. Kirkwood, and just seeing that they believed in me, um, you know, that they knew that I could do something. Um, as some of you know, you know, this, I've been in college a few times before, um, you know, but I've never been able to successfully finish. Um, and that was a very big factor for me, was just having these, besides my family and my friends, you know, having institutional support that was genuine, that was caring, that provided me with opportunities, you know, outside of school. Um, yeah, that meant so much to me. And that was where I was able to, you know, once someone came to our, one of our student affairs meetings that we had every Friday, and they said, hey, you know, the student trustee's stepping down, we need to appoint someone if anyone's interested. And I had no clue what it was, to be honest with you. <laughs> I said, and, you know, I said, hey, you said, I don't know what that is, but no one's interested, but I'll, you know, I'll learn more about it. I talked to Cesar, he was like, you know, he got me in, so I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, my first thing I was appointed, but I was scared, I didn't know what to do. And um, I remember I got my email and I got my password, and I wrote it down, I wrote it down literally under my notes, Anything that scares me, I'm gonna actively pursue. Um, and I had a lot of fears at that time. You know, I was 28 then. I graduated school almost 10 years ago from that moment. I'm um, coming back into school after being, you know, through the pandemic. Um, so I was afraid, I was very afraid. Um, but I kept that note at the top so that every time I went to that folder, every time I made any kind of student trustee note, you know, I knew that that was there. Um, and I, I did it. Everything that, you know, scared me, I pursued it. Um, I'm gonna need more time, should I just no. keep going? Okay. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, you know, being with ASB has just been great. Um, some of the things that we've accomplished since I was able to come on um, has been securing menstrual products for all of our students in the bathrooms for free. Um, that's in the male and the female bathrooms. Uh, we secured stipends for our ASB cabinet so that, you know, we get a little something for the work that we do. Um, I have something really huge that means a lot to me is what me and Ava worked on tirelessly was our land acknowledgement statement um, that we were able to pass um, last fall as well too, early in the fall. And we put a lot of work into that. And I think just being on committees, um, you know, for OER and the auxiliary committee and just <coughs> trying to fight for more, you know, equality for our students and, you know, more things to just make their education a little bit easier. Um, but I'm so grateful for our cabinet again as well too, as Ava was saying, um, because we didn't have, you know, the typical ASB cabinet. We didn't get to throw fun student parties and, you know, we wanted to come together a lot, but we couldn't because of the, um, the different things that were stopping us from doing that. So, um, but we still were able to build that sense of community through it all. So thank you, Kim. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone who was on our ASB that basically made that what it was and kept that community going um, because it wasn't the typical ASB. We did so many different things that most ASBs probably don't do and will never do again, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I think that's been really important for me. Um, getting the confidence, getting the um, respect, I think as well too. You know, you all treated me as if I'm one of you. You know, sometimes I don't feel like a student trustee. I feel like I'm a regular trustee because of the respect that I get from you all. Um, and when I first started, again, you know, I was just, I didn't know what I was really doing. I must admit, you know, um, imposter syndrome hit me hard. I didn't feel like I belonged in that spot. I didn't know what I was doing, you know, like, do I really belong here? Um, I, I couldn't even think of the pledge at one of the meetings because I was so nervous sometimes, you know. It's just little things, but I think as I've gone on, you know, I've been able to gain that confidence. And um, I've been grateful to be an advocate for student mental health for our students of color. Um, but for all of our students, you know, I advocate for those things, but I advocate for all of our students as well, too. Um, and then showing up every day, um, you know, as much as I can, being present, being there, whether it be on Zoom, whether it be in person, still keeping that together. So I'm so grateful for this experience. Um, but I also just want to say, too, it wouldn't be possible without Ava. Ava definitely made things a lot easier for me. Ava was, you know, we were a great, I can't even call you my sidekick, because I feel like, you know, we were both just like superheroes, and we were both kind of did our own thing. But like, we worked together so well. Um, so I really want to thank Ava a lot for all that Ava's kind of done to help me with my position, so I can help her with her position, but so we help the students, which is what matters the most. Um, so yeah, more than anything, like I was saying earlier, I'm just very, very thankful. Um, I know in the last meeting I was pushing for more student trustee pay and everything like that, but I think there's no amount of money to really amount to what this experience has been. Um, and I would do it for free all over again if I had to. Um, and which also reminds me that also when we're, you know, we've been able to finally secure getting students paid for being on committees as well, which me and Ava have been advocating for since day one. So um, it's just a good feeling to see that even though these times have been a little dark and a little bit difficult for every single one of us, um, we've still been able to come through, you know, we've still been able to achieve, we're still been able to move on and do what we can do for our students. So I just want to thank everyone on the dais again. Um, I want to thank every student group and resource that has helped me out, my MSI family, Student Affairs, the Cabinet, um, Basic Needs, and Justin Mendez for helping me with resources to keep going sometimes when things got tough. Um, my mentor, Dr. Hunt, as well, for just kind of everyone for just always being there, you know, not just saying that, but really, really doing it. You know, there's talk is so cheap, so I think that everyone's shown me more than that and with so much action. Um, and I'm just so appreciative of that. So. Thank you, thank you. I'll still be around. <laughs> um, you know, I'll still be here. So I appreciate everything that y'all allowed me to do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Intuk, we have already done the um, presentation, and that was um, Trustee Blackman's last report, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to say a few words to him as well, since you weren't able, you had to step out, so feel free. No problem. My apologies, the emergency situation. Um, Richard, uh, I missed what everyone else said, so maybe I'm going to repeat, but it was a pleasure working with you last, this last year, and uh, through the pandemic and back to in person, uh, to see you grow uh, academically, professionally, uh, move into working uh, in the mayor's office and out in the community, 
uh, you know, this is what we want of student government is to develop great leaders who can collaborate, who can move uh, into different groups uh, because it's, uh, this is what it's like in the, in a, in a, in the real world. We're, we're the real world here too. But, uh, you know, that uh, you can be an effective leader with uh, a diverse setting. And, um, and I, I feel like, you know, you're, so many people have given me compliments about you throughout, you know, on campus and off campus throughout the city. And it's, um, I think, a testament to your commitment to uh, do the right thing and be present and be available uh, and then be authentic. I always felt like you had the students, you know, interest at mind that you were speaking to the issues in the moment uh, in, in a manner that helped give us perspective. You know, and this is our, I think this is our first year that we did student vote first the whole year. So we always got your direction <laughs> before the rest of us voted. I was like, well, the students, okay, I'm, I'm in line with the students on this vote. So uh, appreciate that and um, wish you the best going forward. And I know we'll still stay in touch and here to support you. And of course, I think we would all write letters of recommendation or reference or whatever you need uh, as you move forward to uh, please keep us in mind. We'll be watching. So thank you again. We'll move to item 3.3, Academic Senate Presence Report for Suman. Oh my gosh, I have to follow both of them. Okay. Uh, good evening, Board President Intec, President Superintendent President Munoz, and distinguished board members. This will be a bit of a long report, so please bear with me. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging the dedication and hard work of our ASB President, Ava Cross, and our student trustee, Blackman, um, Richard Blackman. Ava, good luck at your alma mater, at my alma mater, UCLA. Um, and Richard, I know you're going, you're still deciding on where to go, but I know wherever you go, you're going to do really big things. Um, I have learned so much from both of you and I thank you both for your service. Um, and I, I thought of a word that epitomized both of you and the word elegance came to my mind. So um, when I think of both of you, that's what I think about, thank you. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge Asian Pacific Islander Desi Heritage Month here at Long Beach City College. I feel privileged to sit here as the first Asian American ever in this seat. I don't take that lightly. The APID group has been such an honor to be a part of. Our shared Asian experience is in itself similar, rooted in family and community, but our diaspora is so diverse geographically, religiously, and culturally, and through that beautiful contrast, we found a refuge in this space with each other here at Long Beach City College. Thank you to the board for acknowledging and having this resolution today. May is not only Asian American Heritage Month, but it is also Mental Health Awareness Month. And I felt that it was important for me to acknowledge the senseless acts of premeditated murders that occurred on two communities of color because of hate in New York and California, and an entire fourth grade class, and their teacher in Texas. These people lost their lives because of issues of the heart and head. And I bring this up because to me, these murders speak to the immense need for mental health care. Let us focus on making this a priority here at our institution. I wanted to bring, a light, bring to light a bulletin that was released on May 19th from the US Department of Education titled, Building on President Biden's Unity Agenda. Education Department urges colleges to use the American Rescue Plan funds to provide mental health supports to students. I understand that this speaks to the remaining HERF funds that we, but I would advocate that we think about using some of the block grant money that's coming in for these services as well. The Academic Senate is a staunch advocate for allocating resources for mental health care at the institution, of which you'll hear more about during our presentation today. Now on some other items. The Academic Senate had our last meeting of the year on Friday. I want to thank the following senators for their service. Alicia Andujo, Juan Flores Zamora, Tiare Hotra, Janine Pliska, and Karen Daniels. I'd also like to congratulate the new and continuing senators this next year. Wendy Kennig, um, Christy Dulitshahi, Shauna Hageman, Jeff Sable, Mega, Megan Kaplinski, Sarah Blasetti, Milo Alvarez, and Kobe Moritzade. And I want to thank my Senate executive team. You have been um, such a wonderful force to work with this year. I have learned so much from all of you, and I really look forward to an amazing year next year. Some updates. The Senate has passed two resolutions this year, one of which will be shared during our presentation later, and one that I'd like to share now. This resolution is in support of part-time faculty. Whereas, 
Part-time faculty comprise approximately 70% of the faculty at California's community colleges and teach approximately 50% of the classes, as well as provide direct student services through part-time counselors and librarians. Whereas the Academic Senate was successful in getting counseling and library faculty included in the faculty ratio calculations as the student service areas contribute to the education and academic success of students. Also recognized by the Academic Senate through a number of resolutions is that student retention and success depend greatly on the enhanced educational and personal skills in counseling and library programs provide to the students who participate. Whereas in 1968, the Education Code was amended to create part-time faculty positions and fill emergency temporary needs in California's community colleges, yet part-time faculty have been a permanent fixture in California's college system, and many have been teaching on temporary contracts for decades at the same institutions. Whereas part-time faculty are working multiple jobs and earning a living, are not provided adequate space on campus to meet with students and are not compensated for required professional development established by the legislature. Whereas the California Community College's Chancellor's Office has determined that part-time faculty members across the state are paid per hour on average one half as much as full-time faculty members per hour for comparable duties. Two, re two resolves. The Academic Senate of Long Beach City College recognizes the contributions of part-time faculty and their dedication to educating students and providing sufficient support for students to succeed in their coursework and achieve their educational goals. Resolved, the Academic Senate of Long Beach City College supports part-time faculty efforts to achieve parity in compensation to full-time employees for comparable duties. I do have a couple more items, but if I'm at time, I understand. Is there any objection for an additional time? Seeing and hearing no objection, we'll give you a Oh, I appreciate, minutes. thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to give you some updates on what we've done here at the college lately, some other good stuff. Um, student success. I want you all to know that there's a program mapper out right now for our students that is kind of awesome that was done by our Viking Pathways team. And what has been kind of a beautiful I thought in my head was that this has been five years in the making. And five years is sort of the time that it takes for a bamboo to grow when you water the land and you don't see anything. And all of a sudden it just shoots up five years later feet, really hundreds of feet high. So I think that this is sort of, for me, the epitome of that fruit of that labor. And it's beautiful. And our students are going to have a really amazing time being able to go through the program mapper and see how they can get through their programs. Um, I want you all to know that we've had a robust discussion around accessibility. We find that to be a really important topic at both the Senate and Student Success Committee. And I know that that is something that we need to continue to focus on here, not just within our classrooms, but across the institution as a whole. Um, and last, I wanted to talk about a presentation of a student climate survey and experience that was conducted in fall that was presented. Some things that came out of that really stood out to me, and I think it kind of ties back to what I talked about when we spoke about the murders that occurred in Texas and down in south here in California and also in New York. Our black indigenous people of color students consistently report feeling less like they matter or have value in classroom spaces taught by white faculty than their white counterparts. This includes feeling supported by faculty in class discussions and feeling like faculty of concern for their feelings and experiences. Asian students feel the least like they matter in classroom spaces. Both black male and Asian male students are more likely to feel silenced in class based on their social identity than their female counterparts and more than average. And I say all of this because I think that all of this ties back not just to our institution, but globally. We need to start thinking about how do we be more inclusive of everyone in these spaces. Um, we need to really stop to reflect everything and I think that this really comes back to being seen for who we are, valued for who we are, and being respected for who we are. And I thank you and appreciate the extension of time. Thank you so much. Our most precious resource is time. <laughs> Next is 3.4 Classified Senate uh, Presence Report. And we'll go to Cece. Good evening, board members and everyone at the dais. I would like to commend all my colleagues for the amazing work they have done this semester and of course for the past few years. Uh, we are looking 
greatly looking forward to the first in-person commencement in two years. Um, we are very, so very proud of Ava Cross and Richard Blackman. They are exceptional human beings. And Suman said it um, very well about their accomplishments and who they are as people. And I'd also like to uh, commend all of the rest of the constituency group leaders, Suman, Suzanne Englehart, Robert Rometta, and Curtis Williams. Uh, we are a great group. Um, I missed our confab last night. I was kind of bummed I couldn't be there, but uh, we're a great cohesive group. I'm very proud of that. Um, I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it, that we need to model for our students what a positive, collegial, and empowered workplace can be like, and we're not. And this is definitely within the realm of possibility. Everyone must be valued equally. We must treat each other with respect, and I don't really see a reason not to. If we speak of equity, equality, and reconciliation, then we must model it. And there's a lot of things to work on. Zuman reminded us of accessibility and mental health issues. And the collegiality between colleagues is one of those things. The Classified Senate is so grateful for the collegial rep relationship we have with the Classified Union. Workplace and contract issues are not, I repeat, not, under the purview of the Classified Senates in California. However, we are the same group of colleagues. We commend them for the excellent work they do, often under very difficult circumstances. Um, so I will, Subin talked about her new uh, departing and joining council, uh, Senate members, and I will be doing that at the next meeting because our elections are not over. But we have some people leaving and some people joining that we're very excited about. And please check item 7.17 on the agenda to see the new hires and those that are leaving for new endeavors. So I have one more item. Um, Dario, thank you. So our classified hero of the month of May is Angela Folks, and many of you know her. And she, it says hero status financial aid genius, but her title is financial aid technician and enrollment services, student services. And her superpowers are going above and beyond, a bright and shining light and compassionate vision. I'm gonna keep reading. Angela, the person that nominated her said, Angela has a passionate heart that helps her see the student as an individual and assist them with their personal needs and navigate the financial aid system. I am honored and blessed to work amongst such an esteemed colleague as Angela. Her professionalism speaks volumes about her character, and I'm grateful to know Angela and called her a friend. And Angela's quote, that we ask him to do a quote after their nomination, I am blessed to be able to advocate for our valuable LBCC students by building bridges for them that I have already crossed at the community college level. I'm also grateful for the opportunities I've been afforded at LBCC to become both an innovative leader and change agent. Angela's part, this is me talking now, um, Angela's part of the solution of what I was talking about earlier, and I think most people do know that, so we're very proud of her. So thank you, and that's my report. Thank you, CC. Moving now to uh, item 3.5, LBCCFA bargaining presence report for five minutes from Suzanne. Good evening, Board President, Trustee Uduak Joe Ntuk, Superintendent President Mike Munoz, and other distinguished members and colleagues of tonight's meeting. Even Richard, it has been a pleasure getting to know you through our working relationship. My life is better from knowing and working with each of you. And I, like others here tonight, wish you the 
best to your future. You too will be doing amazing, continue to do amazing things. So, um, and I look forward, I hear we have a new uh, trustee and student trustee and ASB president. So I'm, we are looking forward to meeting Alina and Alex. But best to you, thank you. As the semester comes to an end, I want to thank all the faculty, full-time and part-time, and classified for all the work you continue to do to serve our students and our community. I want to thank all the faculty that took time, took the time to send letters, emails, tweets, texts, show up to board meetings, wear red in Zoom meetings, place the culture of care Zoom background in Zoom meetings, and taking the time to write and speak during the public comment, all in support of the negotiation effort. I want to thank our negotiations team, Veronica Alvarez, Robin Arias, Sofia Vez, and Christine Charles Benales. Hopefully one more day before we see the fruits of our labor. I want to thank Robert Rometta, Curtis Williams, Suma Mudanuri, C.C. Sadler. It has been a pleasure working with you, and I look forward to continuing this relationship. I want to thank the leadership of LBCC for their efforts in living out the spirit of collaboration and inclusiveness with FA and its members. I want to thank the Board of Trustees for their efforts in keeping open communications with FA. We may not always agree with each other, but I see a genuine effort to listen and work towards what is best, not just for our students and community, but for the health and safety and working conditions of our members. Congratulations to those members that will be retiring this year. Congratulations to the many new probationary faculty members that continue to stream in. I look forward to welcoming all of them this coming fall. And I want to um, share this next topic of information. It's something that I've been getting a lot of emails about lately. And I have had conversations with different administrators on this, and I understand that it relates to the masking policy. I realize we're following local health orders, and we're moving towards, uh, you know, lifting masks, even though we still are having uh, spikes here and there of, of, of the COVID variant. But since the um, since a communication that went out yesterday morning about 924, uh, it was uh, current and upcoming COVID-19 vaccine policies and masking policies. First and foremost, I want to thank you for a clear communication that came out. How do I know it was clear communication? Because all the emails that I received that clear communication was a result of many collaborative meetings in the return to campus and us asking, hey, there's a lot of information coming here and can you continue to send out clear communications? It was clear, faculty heard that this coming fall, or actually starting this summer, but many faculty members won't be working this summer, that coming this fall, uh, there is no mandatory masks, right? There, it's predominantly strongly suggested. And there's still, a, uh, but almost daily and sometimes multiple during the day, we are still seeing COVID exposures that are seen on campus. People are still getting, you know, becoming sick and ill. And so I've been receiving a lot of emails from my members about concern about being in the classrooms, being around large group of people in student services. And I'm just bringing this to your attention. I know we're gonna to continue to reach out and work and see if there's some kind of creative, innovative way that we can address this issue um, as we move forward. And so I just wanted to end on that. And also I just want to, um, with all the continued, with all these senseless murders that have been going on and all the family members that have been affected that we continue to think about and send prayers and good thoughts to those family members and communities as they go through this healing. And then as um, was mentioned that we learn to live in what we say that we become people that are compassionate and speak against these type of senseless murders. Um, so looking forward to graduation. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next, we move to item 3.6, AFT bargaining presence report for five minutes with Robert. Good evening, President Noon uh, 
President, Nu sorry, President Dr. Nunez, uh, uh, board, board President Nuntak, and esteemed board members in the community of Long Beach, I really appreciate uh, the time to speak tonight. I first want to congratulate our Vikings who are graduating. They're an amazing class who suffered through an amazing time, and I'm happy to be part of making sure they made it through to the end. As for our trustee, Richard, and our ASP president, Ava, best time I've ever had. These people are amazing. I can't wait to see them come in the Hall of Fame for Long Beach City College. They are just the best ever. So moving on to the fun stuff, um, I want to take time tonight and talk about our Viking family, the students and employees of Long Beach City College. I would ask you if you give your family less than basic needs to survive in today's economy. We speak a lot about equity. I would ask you if you feel classified compensation is equitable. We often hear that faculty continue to show up for students, and I agree with that. Faculty and Chai are amazing bunch. But I'd like to add that classified show up not just for our students, but also for our faculty and our administrators as well. We are a Viking team. When our campus shut down to do, due to COVID-19, classified re remained. We cleaned, sterilized, cared for the ground. And for some of us, particularly in the trades in nurse and health sciences, we were the original uh, building monitor. Classified health screening students and faculty. We were literally the front line of COVID protection for the college. I implore you to send a clear message that we valued and appreciated by the college. We suffered through furloughs in the past. We suffered layoffs. No raise out of the six out of the past 10 years. Due to COVID and the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, we are facing inflation that's the highest in over 40 years. At this time, when the state man, uh, mandated COLA is now at 6.56, the district was able to eliminate two million in deficit spending, add approximately seven million to our already healthy reserve, and receive unprecedented influx of cash from various donors, including 30 million from an equity gift. Let us bring it back, family, equity, Viking value. Let's talk the talk and let's walk the walk. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Robert. Next, we'll move to item 3.7. This is the Chai President's report. It's five minutes uh, with Curtis. Hi, I'm Curtis Williams. Uh, this is my last uh, time as, as President of Chai because my term ends June 30th this year. Uh, and we're going to have an election, so hopefully we'll have uh, some other people show up. I am uh, grateful for the time that I've been able to work with you. Unfortunately, uh, things have not gone very well. When, when the ballot came out and there was no one on the ballot uh, for the shy officers, I mounted a write-in campaign. And my wife said, are you insane? And I agree with her now because I saw <laughs> all that, that Karen had done. But dealing with some of the inequities that we have in our society is just a a huge challenge. My son is a, a school teacher in Portland, uh, an elementary school teacher, and uh, all my kids are Latinx, and he sent me pictures of every uh, person who was killed in the elementary school in Texas, and they all looked like my kids. And that difficulty of the challenge that we face with, with this outside world, we don't want that to be here. Now, Long Beach City College is my home, uh, Robert and I both have, have mothers who worked here. My mom was a nutritional biochemist who taught nutrition for, from 1955 until she retired in 91. Uh, she was part-time for some of that, and then she was full-time as well. Many of the people want to be full-time. They think, oh, if I just play my cards right and join committees and help out, I'll be recognized. And do that for years and years, never get uh, a full-time job. It's, it's a quirk of history. I mean, our land acknowledgement shows that it's a quirk of history that we were able, as, as a society, to take land from people who, who had it before us. 
And so in 1968, as Suman mentioned, there was this emergency uh, need to have teachers in the community college, which were part of the K-14 K system. And it's been ongoing. And now is a time to ch make this a change. Um, we, we've got to have some, some change. Uh, to look back when I started teaching in 1996 here at Long Beach City, uh, my, my salary was very much the same as it is now. And I see everyone else's salaries soaring uh, on the outside. I have, uh, my brother works for Amazon and his salary has gone up like crazy. Now I'm, I've been a, a, an administrator at, a, at a, a private college for a while, so I have another job, but I have people here who call me on a regular basis and say, I can't make ends meet. And if we're offered just a few percentage points, of the cola that came in from um, the state of California, it's a huge challenge to say, oh, you're going to have to take a 9% cut because the increase of, of gasoline and electricity and everything else uh, is not going to spare these people. Uh, I, I wanted to mention Ulysses. He served on a committee. Uh, I was on the IT committee, and I've been on that committee for a long time. He was always there. And Richard and Ava, fantastic. These are the students that we need to focus on. But uh, if someone was going to ask me, should I become a part-time faculty member, I would probably advise them not to do that, especially at Long Beach City College, because there's not a commitment. There's $200 million in the governor's budget for health care. And we need to negotiate that to get that money here to offset some of the costs of our medical care. And we, we need to make that a, a, something that's will from the Board of Trustees level. When we got uh, $55 million in HERF funds, a, a very small proportion of that came in for the part-time faculty. The part-time faculty just got $500, or if they were over 10 units or 33%, uh, they got $1,000. And the agreement was going to be for two years. And then when I asked, hey, when are we going to get the second payment? I was told, oh no, that was just for the one, one year. And so through the, through the way that the, the contract, our, our bargaining contract was written, it looks like either I'm wrong or it's not been followed through on, but there's money for this. People had to go home and use their own internet, their own power, and work, work like crazy to learn how to teach online during the COVID uh, pandemic. We need to change this. People have been heroes and they're not treated like heroes. We have people start here because there's jobs available as part-time faculty, but the moment they can, they move someplace else because other places are giving the COLA and they're acknowledging the part-time faculty uh, do an amazing job for our students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Curtis, and thank you for your service to Chai and to the college all these years. We appreciate you. Uh, moving to Section 4 of Superintendent President's report, Item 4.1 is Dr. Munoz's report for 10 minutes. Thank you, Board President Nintuck. Good evening, Board members, colleagues, and community members. Um, I know that it's been mentioned by others tonight, but before I get started, I just, with my board update, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge the immense pain um, that we're all feeling. Um, in result of the recent tragedies um, in Buffalo, in South Orange County, and in yesterday in Texas. Um, so again, I just wanted to, I, I, I didn't feel like I can just go straight into the report without acknowledging that and just know that as a campus community, we're here to support and uplift one another. And I've, you know, we, we've mentioned this a lot where we have a culture of care and we're a Viking family. And so if any of our students or any of our faculty members and staff are hurting, please reach out reach out to us, reach out to Human Resources, and we will definitely do what we need to do to connect you with that support. So with that said, it's my great privilege to share some of the activities and efforts that I would like to report on from this past month. So the first activity I'd like to share is at the end of April, I had the opportunity to attend the American Association of Community Colleges annual conference in New York. Um, I had the privilege to present the LBCC's Framework for Recon Reconciliation alongside Board President Entuck and Vice President Chico. We were able to speak um, at a room at full capacity with our colleagues from across the country. It was a very engaging presentation, many questions from folks. And, and you know, it's, it's, sometimes you have to leave California and to get into that kind of national um, 
to gain that national perspective and to to engage with colleges that may have an appointed board versus an elected board or where you can't even use the word equity um, in a classroom because it's it's seen as something that is divisive, right? So it was, it was a very enlightening experience and I'm very proud to share that our presentation was actually covered by Community College Daily, which is a national publication. Um, so I'd like to thank both Dr. Tracy Carmichael and Aaron Murphy for their collaboration and work to prepare this presentation. Um, and again, thank you to Board President Entuk and Vice President Chico for um, presenting alongside me. Our next item that I'd like to share with you all is an update on our grad fest. Um, while we were attending our conference in New York, the show went on here at LBCC, and I hear it was a really great show that I hated to miss. Um, we held our very first grad fest to honor the class of 2022. Um, LBC celebrated nearly 700 students that day. We had breakfast, lunch, ice cream, resource stations, games, and opportunities for graduates to get their regalia. They even had an opportunity to, de to decorate their caps in preparation for the big day on June 9th. So don't forget, commencement starts at 3 p.m. It's an hour earlier this year because we are also including the classes of 2020 and 2021. Um, it will be live, in person, Vets Memorial Stadium, and we can't wait. The next activity I'd like to bring, um, bring you up to speed on is some campus community events. Um, with the end of the academic year coming upon us so quickly, it was really the opportunity to celebrate our students and all the great accomplishments. So, um, Omoja, the Honors Banquet, Scholarship Luncheon, ASB, Classified Appreciation Luncheon, the Foundation Golf Tournament, just to name a few. Um, we've also had some in-person affinity, affinity group graduation celebrations. We celebrated our LGBTQ plus grads at the Lavender graduation celebration last night, I believe. Tomorrow night, we have the Raices cultural graduation celebration. Friday is the Asian Pacific Islander Desi graduation celebration, and next Tuesday, we will have the Black graduation celebration. This is definitely the best time of year. So we got to meet Ulysses earlier, but let me just give you a little bit more information and background on Ulysses. The Jack Kent Cook Foundation provides the largest private scholarship in the country to exceptionally talented community college students who have financial need. This year, um, he was one of only 100 students selected in the country, um, and again, we're extremely proud of him. So Ulises Malonado was selected to receive up to $55,000 per year for tuition, living expenses, books, and required fees to complete his bachelor's degree. He was selected from a, nation, a nationwide pool of more than 1,200 applicants based on his academic achievement, unmet financial need, persistence, and leadership. Again, big congratulations to Ulysses. We are very proud of him. I'm also really excited to share with you that we had the opportunity to participate in the Sean Lamaki Innovation Center grand opening. On April 13th, we celebrated the opening of Blank Spaces Long Beach and the Sean Lamaki Innovation Center in downtown Long Beach. This is a partnership with the city of Long Beach. We are looking forward to offering training programs and counseling through, um, for our small business owners to get hands-on training for everything from how to access capital to drawing up a business plan. Pat and I's LBCC SBDC team will also likely offer workshops and other programming at the center as needed. Um, also, just kind of as a side note, I, it's, it's a tremendous facility, so if you had an opportunity to tour it, I encourage you to do so. Um, but as we were sitting there in this space, I was speaking to the, the lead director from, um, from the Blank Spaces program, and we were thinking, you know, what are some other potential uses for this space? And so we had this idea, I kind of pitched it to him, and so we're going to be meeting next week, but what if you're an online student and you don't have reliable internet? or you need a quiet place to have a study group, or you need to take an exam and you share a bedroom with a sibling, why not be able to go to blank spaces and do your test in a private room, or you know, study with some friends in a, in a study room without having to take the bus all the way to PCC or LAC. So we're gonna even explore that opportunity for our, our online students to provide that support as well. So next slide. So I'm really excited to share the CMMA award that we received for CLAC. The Southern California chapter of the Construction Management Association of America, CMAA, so not the 
Country Music Awards, that's the first thing I thought, but CMMA has selected LBCC's new Kinesiology Lab and Aquatic Center, otherwise known as CLAC, as a 2022 Project Award winner. This project will be recognized on June 30th during the 29th Annual Award Gala. Congratulations to all involved in the CLAC creation, Vice President, oh, I gotta look this way, Vice President Drinkwine, so thank you, Vice President Drinkwine, for your leadership, Walter Johnson, Randy Tutorp, um, as well as the Cordoba team, which I know we have some representatives from Cordoba in the audiences today with us. This project continues to well communities for so many, from so many angles. So again, congratulations, y'all. Next slide. I'm excited to also um, promote and acknowledge that this month is APID Heritage Month. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that May is Asian Pacific Islander Daisy Heritage Month. Our APID Heritage Month planning group has been working extremely hard for many months to put together all of the different workshops, events, and lectures. I know that they're ending the month strong this week with several events, so if you haven't had an opportunity, I encourage you to attend. I'm looking forward to showing you a highlight video next month of all the wonderful activities of our APID colleagues. And just a side note, I had the opportunity to um, attend the kind of kickoff opening of our new learning community the Manak community. And this is a learning community that's gonna really focus on supporting our Pacific Islander students. And so it's a really, I think, important, you know, as we know, we have Puente and Omoja and other um, affinity group-based learning communities. And so this is a new learning community that we're gonna be adding um, to Long Beach City College's support systems. And so we're really excited about that. Next slide, please. So I'm really also excited to share that we're in preparations to kick off Pride Month. And so in, in, as such, last week, we kicked off our celebration with attorney, historian, and activist author, Zaylor Stite. Zaylor visited our campus, and we had a robust discussion connecting historical events to what is happening in the LGBTQ plus community, including the treatment of transgender athletes and the Don't Say Gay bills that were passed in Florida. And earlier this week, we once again raised the pride flag at our campuses in honor of Harvey Milk Day. The pride flag will be flown for the entire month of June, and you can see some of the great photos from the pride flag raising ceremony earlier this week. So let's talk about our upcoming Juneteenth celebration. I would like to invite our campus community and our community at large to the Liberal Arts Campus on Saturday, June 18th from noon to 4 p.m. We will be celebrating Juneteenth on the south end of the A building with music and dance performances, free food, and a resource fair. The theme for this year is connecting the past to the present. What does Juneteenth mean to me? So we hope we see you all. And cl to close out my presentation, I'm really excited to provide an update and highlight the work of one of our amazing faculty members, Trisha Wilging. Trisha, can you just wave to us? Could we all see you? Thank you. So I would like to share how one of our faculty members who has given back to the global community, Trisha Wilging, who is also our Student Learning's Outcomes Coordinator and Associate Professor of Reading here at LBCC. She returned after two weeks of assisting Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Through her church, Trisha took time off to help build and distribute care packages and help provide resources to the refugees. She plans on finishing up this semester, but she hopes to travel back to Poland this summer to volunteer one more time. Thank you, Trisha, for giving up your time by volunteering the, for the Ukrainian refugees and bringing awareness to this important issue. I am grateful to be your colleague. And that concludes my report. Thank you, and go Vikings. Thank you for the, for the great report. Uh, thank you for everyone, what they do. Um, we'll go now to 4.2. Um, this is new in a revised board policies, administrative procedures, chapter three, General Institution Board Policies 3280. This is a first reading. Attached is a, a draft of the uh, Board Policy and Administrative Procedure, and these are for grants. I know we, I think we moved an agenda item. Did we move the Academic Senate before or after? After, after 5.1? Okay. Excellent. So next we'll go to a presentation. This is a 15 minute presentation with up to 25 minutes of questions and answers from the board of trustees and each trustee has an equal uh, allotted five minute opportunity to ask questions. Uh, but this is uh, a presentation. Sorry, let me 
get it up here. This is a presentation on veteran stadium funding options. Uh, we have several presenters, uh, Alfred Frio, Jr., partner at Shepherd Mullen, Michael Boomsa, Senior Vice President of Education Facilities with Cordoba, and Adam Bauer, uh, President and CEO of Feldman Rolop and Associates. Uh, and so this is a joint presentation and I think I'll hand, hand the baton to Mike to start. Good evening, uh, Board President uh, Inta, Superintendent President, uh, uh, Dr. Munoz and uh, fellow trustees and staff. Thanks for having us and we're excited to come here and give you an update. I know we met with you via Zoom back in February, I believe it was the 15th and it's uh, good to you know, be back and have, uh, have you in person at the diet. So thank you for having us. Uh, slide please. Uh, here's what we'll be talking about, uh, some timeline of events that have led up to here, uh, an opportunity for a potential ballot measure, uh, the components of what that would be, and kind of the roadmap uh, going forward, what that would look like. Uh, here's an event timeline. Um, if you recall, back uh, up to November, we had been exploring some of the highest and best value use of the uh, LAC South Campus area. Uh, in, in January, uh, we also finished our feasibility study of the uh, vet, vet stadium, which came with a recommendation that new construction would uh, be recommended in lieu of a modernization. If you recall, in our 2041 master plan, modernization was the money that had been allocated. Uh, I do realize this is a, a review, but I'm trying to make sure that everyone's up to speed so that uh, when we go into discussion, there's not any miss. miss so I'll go fast through this part and then kind of talk about what we've been doing since our last meeting. Um, our last meeting was in February, as you recall. Uh, where we said, you know, hey, we want to look at some joint use uh, type of uh, agreements and see if that would actually be viable uh, for you know, in the best interest of the district and the best interest of that land. Uh, so we uh, marched through April. We we did that due diligence. I'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Uh, and then on uh, you know, May 25th, here we go. Uh, here we are here to, to kind of report back. Okay, as a reminder. I think it's undeniable that everyone agrees uh, that Bed Stadium is uh, an iconic uh, landmark uh, that serves the community very, very well. Uh, it's also just uh, really, really old. Uh, it was almost 50 years old when I played high school football there, uh, and I know there are the, those that have been used a lot longer than that as well. Uh, it's been renovated, it's been expanded, we put a lot of lipstick on it. Uh, that was all planned, uh, and that was all good. Uh, but since we set aside money for modernization, um, back for Measure LB, we've actually had some spalling of the concrete. And if you recall, I, I showed pictures of that last time, uh, how uh, you know, we were able to keep that under control, but that was you know, some structural uh, issues that we had to address, which were well above and beyond kind of what we expected for the life cycle. Uh, so we looked into what, would, you know, what, would, what would it would need to be to bring it up to the current construction technology, uh, and we came up with some recommendations. Uh, this is a review. Uh, we've talked about modernization and some of the risks of that is, you know, you, you dump 141 millions into, into a modernization. Oh, by the way, these were uh, prices from, you know, back in January. Uh, the, those prices have all gone up significantly since then. I want to warn you about that. Everyone's very familiar with the escalation that we're seeing, both in the construction industry as well as uh, throughout, uh, throughout the local area and beyond. Um, the, you know, even if we modified it, it still wouldn't get us what we needed as far as NCAA requirements. Um, and when you combine all that with, you know, the unknown repairs of when we really get into the bones of the, of the stadium, uh, it was kind of a no-brainer. We said, hey, it's going to be uh, $185 million minimum uh, to get the stadium built new, just to be on par with local junior, you know, community colleges uh, with similar stadiums. Oh, by the way, we have the Olympics coming up. We don't know whether that'll be a play or not, but we want to have it be consideration. Uh, and we definitely wouldn't, that we wouldn't be a player. If we the so uh, we, we presented that conclusion. Uh, we asked you if we could go do some more due diligence, and we did. Uh, so what have we been doing since our last meeting? We continue to look at the highest and best uh, use of the stadium, as well as the adjacent land. So we don't want to just limit it to the stadium. We want to look at ar around it and how can we bring the most value. Uh, and we've done that. Uh, we actually went through an RFQ process, and uh, you know, pretty much wrote an RFQ for, uh, you know, some type of joint use or P3, and we kind of went through the, uh, uh, that process. And what that does is it brings out some of the, you know, what does the district value, do what's important to us, how much control do we want, and during those discussions, um, we also created a construction schedule, what that would take for a 2028 20, Olympics consideration, uh, you know, just, just to be viable for that. 
uh, as well as just to be viable to be able to serve the community the way we are now uh, as soon as possible before the stadium gets worse. Uh, we solicited a third party market analysis proposal, which we actually still have in our hip pocket. Uh, we can we, we have that ready to go regardless of if what direction we go in this, but that's something that's good for us to know as we go forward. So we kind of put the left and right bookmark bookends on you know, what we want the stadium to be, how it will best serve uh, the district. Uh, with that, we felt necessary to come back to you uh, to ask just for the ability to explore an additional option. We, we, we felt that we maybe left an option on the table or off the table that we want to put back on the table, and that's just an opportunity for uh, a potential bond measure as a single revenue source for the stadium. Uh, we're not saying that that's the direction we're going to go, but that came up in discussion, and we hadn't gone to you and asked for permission to actually go forward with some of the steps that, that we'll brief in just a second about you know, to see if that is viable uh, and if there's an appetite for that local community. Uh, our rationale for that, you know, is you know, given the urgency of the repairs, uh, as well as the, the market constraints, you know, the cost of money is a, a large part of any type of joint use or P3. Uh, that's very volatile right now and uh, but could, could potentially put us into a situation where, you know, our options are more limited than they would have been, you know, prior to the market uh, being the way, you know, turning to the way it is now. Uh, so P3 may or may not end up as the viable option just based on the math behind it uh, and the interest rates and the cost of money. Uh, and we didn't want to have uh, that become potentially not a viable option with out another viable option that we could bring in front of you. And based on the timeline of any ballot measure, uh, we needed to come to you now to at least see if we uh, be able to explore uh, for those options. And with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it, as Michael mentioned, it really is an opportunity for us to think about how we add value to our collective collaboration around uh, facilities management the legal aspects around a potential ballot measure and of course doing the due diligence. Uh, as Michael mentioned, um, we have spent some time thinking about what is the best option for expediting the uh, development of uh, veteran stadium given the assessment that was done um, that was quite rigorous in identifying the need for uh, major improvement where the most economical option was uh, the rebuild of the stadium. We know that the stadium itself um, provides a, a unique resource and, and value to the district. Uh, we think of it as not only an asset for operations and uh, events for students, uh, athletes, and the like, but also an asset for the community. So we, we thought about uh, where we were relative to the uh, potential for a partnership with the private sector. And uh, what we recognize is that we're in a unique political climate um, for several key reasons. The first is that we understand there to be a significant effort at the statewide level to continue to uh, recognize the importance of community colleges as it relates to uh, facilities improvements and also the need for additional funding for uh, a number of facilities, whether it's student housing or other types of facilities that are serving the community. Um, we are also aware of a number of ballot measures that are going to be on the ballot that specifically address the issue of housing um, and meeting other uh, needs by community college with a vulnerable population. We took that into consideration and also balanced the fact that the district's 2016 uh, ballot measure was met by the electorate with significant success. We know that we had 64% 60 of the voters in support. Um, and the prioritization and the acknowledgement was that they trusted the district and they understood that there was a need to improve community facilities. We take that then and also, uh, as Michael mentioned, begin to assess where the private market conditions are currently at. We know that we as an economy have been dipping into uh, the bear market and uh, we know that there's been some constraints around uh, capital markets in terms of uh, investment in facilities nationally, given the, rate, the increase in interest rates and some other additional constraints that have been presented um, because of the instability both domestically and internationally. Uh, we're all very familiar with that as well. So what we wanted to do was think about 
not only uh, being nimble and flexible as it relates to some of the uh, economic work that we've done, but also be deliberate about thinking in regards to public funding that might be available uh, for the stadium reconstruction through a ballot measure. We think that the amount of capital that we have in reserves um, as a district, if we are successful with this ballot measure, will give us an opportunity also to invest in other priority projects while completing the construction of the stadium. As was mentioned by Michael, the, the need for repairs obviously is, is omnipresent in terms of the uh, opportunity for rebuilding the stadium. We have been investigating other P3 opportunities for the redevelopment of not only the stadium but other facilities. But we think that if the district is successful with regards to this ballot measure, it really opens up um, a number of tools that the district can use. Um, in the uh, a couple of slides, and, and Michael will go into greater detail on the diligence that's going to be required for this, we know that we're going to need some significant uh, analysis as it relates to the feasibility of the ballot measure. Uh, we will be coming, as uh, uh, Michael indicated, uh, at subsequent meetings and some potential special uh, meetings that we are proposing to present some of that data so that we have an opportunity to provide some data-driven decisions as it relates to the feasibility of this ballot measure. And very specifically, what we need is three studies to be completed and um, the subject of our presentation today is requesting approval from um, your uh, board uh, as it relates to three key things. The first is Adam's team, as he will discuss, uh, needs to do an assessment on property valuations, which is a state mandated, re mandated requirement to proceed with the ballot measure. Second, we, as was done in the prior uh, diligence for the 2016 bo uh, bond measure, we need to solicit input from the voters and conduct some polling. And uh, third, we need to also evaluate a uh, communication strategy as it relates to key opportunities for what may resonate with voters around the kinds of facilities that could be presented as eligible for funding with the bond. What I would say is that our team is committed to ensuring that we are thorough about the possibilities for the success of this measure. We're taking deliberate steps to consider all our options as it relates to potential funding. But we do think that, as I mentioned previously, given the context, both in terms of what's going to be on the ballot, the market conditions in the private sector that are demonstrating some longer term constraints around private capital being invested in these kinds of facilities, and the recognition that we also have other priorities to focus on as it relates to capital improvements. Committing to a bond measure for the Veterans Stadium is, I think, an extraordinary opportunity, and it was our commitment to present that to you all for consideration. I'll turn it over now to Michael for additional details on that. So on our next slide, well, thank you once again, and my name is Adam Bauer. Our firm is Phil and Rollup Associates. We served as your financial advisor. Uh, these are charts that look like typical financial charts. On the far right there, I've talked about the municipal market data. That is what we monitor to see how interest rates are for governmental entities. Uh, we've talked a bit about that spike to the far left there. That was when we all shut down for COVID-19. Then you went ahead and sold bonds, did several refinancings, all during that lull. So good job. You got a lot done when rates are low, saving your taxpayers money. And now rates have trended upward. And while this looks dramatic, we are still at or below historic norm. And so I think that the takeaway I'm hoping you see on this slide is that you've really done a good job managing during that time when rates were so low, and we'll continue to monitor them going forward. On the next slide, even more important than interest rates are the changes that you've had in your assessed value. And you've had very consistent growth over time that supports the very high ratings that you maintain to keep uh, tax rates low for your taxpayers. But we also have new data coming out in late July, and we'll be able to update this, which is probably going to show pretty well. This area has done well um, with uh, homes turning over and property values. 
And so kind of what does all this mean? It really gets to this next slide. When we're looking at a measure, we've talked about a 270, 285 million. And so those other two items were so important because we had to determine, could we support that with the other items that you have? And the short answer is yes. This next slide focuses on tax exempt versus taxable. Most of the bonds that you've sold, but not all, but most of the bonds that you've sold are when investors buy them, if they're within the state of California, they don't pay California taxes on it and they don't pay federal taxes on it. So they land at a lower rate than, uh, than otherwise would. So our goal is to get as much of your bonds in a tax exempt state as we can and in a balance we do in taxable. The issue that we're working through with the stadium is it does have private use which limits our ability to tax exempt bonds. So we didn't have a lot of time to look at this, but what we did was we said, if we could do it all tax exempt, what does that mean? And that gets you like in a 16 to $18 tax rate. And if we do it all taxable, what does that mean? And it gets you about 21 or $22 tax rate. And that is below the maximum allowed of 25. And so now we've been working with your legal counsel to determine where do we fit? We know we're not, we know we're not 100% tax exempt and we know we're not 100% taxable. And over the next few weeks, we'll continue to work through that. But good news is you have the capacity to do it no matter where we end up there. And so then these next two really get focused on kind of what the, some of the next steps are with, uh, on our May 24th meeting here. But I did speak to tax rates already, so I'll turn it over to, um, oh, turn it over here for the next step. Thank you, um, uh, Adam. What we wanted to do is to quickly identify uh, and, and briefly, uh, so we can open it up to questions, is identify a roadmap of the uh, meetings that we need to take with deliberate speed to be able to proceed with a, a decision point on the authorization of a ballot measure. Um, we have, of course, the 88-day deadline um, to be able to file a resolution for the election, which is August 12th. We expect, as I mentioned earlier, to have the opportunity uh, with your approval today to proceed with the uh, community polling and surveys that we need um, and be able to present that information to you all for consideration uh, in June. We know that there's a June 22 regular board meeting. Um, we hope that at that meeting, if we are able with uh, your um, uh, support, have a special board meeting on June 8th to be able to uh, present and consider a resolution for approving that bond measure. Um, we think that if we move with uh, uh, sufficient speed and engage the consultant that we need and were uh, identified by Michael, uh, Adam, and myself, we can provide the necessary information that we need to make that uh, informed decision. Subsequent to that meeting, we will have in uh, July and then ultimately in, at the end of July for the board meeting, uh, a final review of some of the polling data. We get to also uh, fine tune some of the uh, outreach and community engagement work that we think is necessary and identify the key language that we can include in this ballot measure uh, for purposes of um, garnering the most support from the voters. One of the things that we have been looking at is to be intentional about focusing on the veteran stadium. But we also don't want to be necessarily predetermining the kind of language that might be uh, compelling to the voters in that ballot measure. And so we want to be open to that. We want to defer to our experts that we hope to engage with and ultimately present to you a compelling package and uh, resolution in draft form that you might consider. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have a hand up from Trustee Baxter. Sure, but I was going to write you a note first. Okay, uh, th this um, this is very interesting, and I, I know you spent a lot of time uh, with this, so I was madly writing questions. First thing, almost everybody I ever meet with, constituents, say how beautiful our campus is and how impressed they are with both campuses. And so I think that's a tribute to the bond management and to the, our um, facilities and everything else. So, you know, I think the public would, would um, really uh, be supportive of this. Um, we have an all-weather track. Am I going too far ahead 
to say is that going to be able to be maintained? Or can you, you could tell me no, I don't know at this time, and I'll accept that. It would likely not. Uh, you, if we build a, are you talking about the brand new st stadium that we built eventually? Would we keep it in the exact same spot so that we could preserve the all weather track that currently exists? Yeah. Uh, we would only do that if it was a cost benefit. Uh, okay. We would look at the cost of replacement and the cost of trying to construct a over $100 million stadium around that, and we would. Yeah. I, I would, I would more than likely say 90 or 99% sure that the okay. math would not work out. Well, I, I wasn't trying. I'm yeah. just curious because it's supposedly state of the art and all that kind of stuff. There's, um, a, there's a life cycle though on that track. Uh, oh, there is. They don't last forever. That's correct. Okay. So we oh, would look okay. at that. We would look at the life cycle. Uh, we would also look at where are we going to run our events during the time of the construction. And, yeah. And, and all that uh, goes into just you know, the most cost effective okay. solution. Um, also, I know that you're going to do a feasibility study as far as how the public perceives the, uh, the bonds and, and the acceptance of the bonds. And we have had a strong track record of public support in all the bond measures. And uh, so I'll, I'll be looking forward you know, to hearing how that goes. And then, so you're, what percentage do you think the, uh, and I'm using the wrong word, nonprofit part of the tax bond and the, and the profit part of the tax bond. 50-50 or you don't know, and that's okay if you don't know because this is preliminary. Yeah, so the legal analysis is not done yet, but um, I, we don't know yet, but we, that's what we intend to follow up on. Okay, uh, because I think that will make a big difference in my mind, but I also understand that you don't want to do it all nonprofit because... Um, that that could hurt the future and what and what we want to use uh, as far yeah. as that. When you say it makes a big difference, it really does. It makes a difference between about four dollar per hundred thousand dollars on the tax. Roll. So we want to we want to try to get as much of it tax exempt as we can. Well, the first bond that we did, and I've been here for all of them. Uh, you know, they said it was the the price of a pizza, fifteen dollars and sixty six cents. Great. That was a long time ago. That's right. This is the difference of a Starbucks. Okay. All right. Dr. Baxter, if I can, it's Marlene. I just wanted to add to that conversation that what we're doing when we're identifying what portion would be tax exempt versus taxable is we're first looking at what is the structure right now. Exactly what portion of our use of that stadium generates revenue versus use for us or other public agencies. And then we want to give ourselves room to grow, room to provide more opportunity to generate revenues from this, although our primary purpose is to serve district and district students, but we recognize there's opportunities here. So there's a magic point in there that makes sense for us. Okay. All right, that thank you. That's, that's all I have. Thank, and no, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this, so I'm not, I don't want to lead you to think I'm not, but I'm just thinking of all the angles. And Dr. Baxter, I, to your first point about how, I, and I appreciate the credit that you gave the bond management team for uh, you know, how great this campus looks, but I would actually flip that back to the taxpayers. You, you really, it's them who, without the, without the previous bonds, they wouldn't, we, the community wouldn't have uh, the facilities that they have, and without something done about that stadium, they won't have a stadium uh, that we feel the community wants. And part of our due diligence, our continued due diligence, will be to make sure that you know that what we feel that the community wants is in fact matching with with what they're willing to a pay for via potential bond, and also there's you know, an appetite for what that's you know, how big and how you don't want to exceed what what. No, and I thank thank you, Mr. Bonsa. I understand that, and I think that's the beauty of the state stadium. It is not only used, but like commencements coming up from the different high schools. There's all kinds of events being held there, and that makes it a community. Like you said, it's a iconic um, uh, structure. But I also know that it's, there's serious um, structural problems that need to be solved, and that was one of the reasons the city gave it to us for a dollar. And they did. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we do have a virtual uh, trustee that you may not see, but she is chiming in. Vivian, can you hear us, or can you unmute yourself? Yes.
David, um, my name is Adam Bauer, and I'll answer number one, and Ms. Brinkwine, I think, will answer number two. So item one, we've reached out and gotten some cost estimates for the survey to poll about uh, 500 of your residents, which gives us the margin of error that we'd be looking for in most cases. That would be $40,000, and that's consistent with what we've seen in other areas. And then the... Trustee Malaulu, this is Marlene. It would come from the unrestricted general fund. So the first two portions of this process, both the survey and the initial consulting would come from the unrestricted general fund. Um, the campaign would be supported through donations. And then after that, if the bond were approved, all the costs of the construction for the stadium would be covered from the proceeds of that bond. Is there a way that if the bond is approved, we could go back and uh, sort of reimburse ourselves for that 40000 back into the unrestricted general fund? No, that is an investment from the unrestricted general fund, one-time funds that the district would be making towards this effort. Got it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and then question number two? Question number thank two. You, so I, I didn't finish answering question number one, though. No. There's a second piece to that, and there's two consultants. A communication consultant is also important, and their fee would be depend on whether a ballot, we actually put a measure in a ballot. If we put a measure in a ballot, their fee would be $30,000. If a measure does not go in a ballot, just for that initial amount, it's $15,000. So the, um, it'd be 55,000 if it doesn't go on the ballot and then another 15 if it should go on. And in answer to your question, how much is left, I think it's easier to talk about how with the 2041 master plan, we've identified all these projects and dedicated the entirety of the remaining portions of the 2006 bond as well as measure LB to those projects. In the intervening years, we've had some changes in priorities and at our last special meeting, we talked about what was left to go and what those changes in priorities meant. Basically, we have fully budgeted the entirety of those bond measures. Um, we have made some decisions in some cases to reduce scope on some projects in order to increase scope on the others. 
what that means is that we currently have approximately $89 million dedicated to Vet Stadium in the current 2041 master plan. Should we shift gears and move forward in an attempt to have an approved bond measure to support it, then that means that $89 million would be available to support other unfunded needs. For example, the Integrated Energy Master Plan has several identified measures. We only have about 50% of funding available to support those sustainability measures. We've also since identified other major needs such as access control, which includes keyless control and entry and lockdown of all our facilities, along with a, a notification system that's not just audible, but also visual for accessibility in cases of an emergency. So that is estimated to be about $10 million. So not to get too deep in the money, but if this went forward, Whatever we have budgeted currently out of the 2041 master plan for Vet Stadium would then be redirected with Board of Trustee approval to other necessary projects. And, and do those other, thank you for the explanation. I, I actually did follow that very clearly. Would us redirecting the money to other quote unquote necessary projects, would that have an impact on the bond money that voters would approve. Would that make a difference? It would not make a difference, and I will specify that those other projects we would redirect it to would meet the requirements of both of those bond measures. We always comply with the projects designated in the actual measures themselves as approved by the voters. So I just wanna reassure you that when we do that redirection, we always comply with those bond measures. And that this future bond measure, as you heard explained, we would again re-specify a project list according to board direction, as well as the feedback we get on that public polling effort. Trustee Malu, Trustee Malu, you've hit your five minute question uh, time period. We can come back at the end if there's additional time for additional questions. Okay, I appreciate that. I have one more question if there's more time. Thank you. We'll go to Trustee Zia. Thank you, great job. Um, I have to tell you, I am a little bit puzzled as to why the change of direction. You gave a presentation in February. I understand you went and examined it further. It seems to me to be a complete U-turn or 180, and now we're gonna go to the ballot route. Um, I'm not opposed to it, I'm not excited about it, I'll be honest with you, because I don't know the specifics. Primarily, it's hard for me to tell why um, we're aiming for making it Olympic size or Olympic um, material for 2028. Why can't we scale it down and work within the means that we have, with the budget that we have within Measure LB? That's one question. Two is, the primary issue for me, and um, I think my colleagues who have shared this sentiment, is we have quite a bit of homeless students. That's paramount to get them housing. I haven't heard any mention of that in the estimate. So what does the estimate include? And then lastly, um, is 500, a, um, 500 people a, sa a, a sample pool that will be indicative of the 500,000 plus population and how much would the estimate on their um, property taxes be? If we are not ready to share that, how can we hit, hit the press button and go and poll these people? Because if I get a call, I'll be honest with you, I'll be like, okay, how much is this gonna cost me? Maybe it's just all about the shekels in my book. And my, and, but I see the affordability rate is really low in housing, um, Long Beach, our sales taxes and our property taxes. Um, would someone in Newport Beach or Irvine, as a lot of these folks um, who live there, would they pay for this? Um, uh, a lot of these consultants, that's what I would uh, uh, want to understand better to see what would be the bottom line uh, impact to the taxpayer before I say yay or nay on exploration, exploration route. Thank you. I'll go first. I think one of your first questions was, could we scale it down to fit with the, in, within the original budget? Um, and if you recall, so we, when we passed the 24, or when we proposed the 2041 master plan and we went out and made promises to the taxpayers, um, you know, for the, it, and we've been very transparent with that process as well as in the updates to the, the project list. 
Uh, and I would stand up in front of any taxpayer and say promises you know, made, promises kept with, with that. Uh, obviously, there are some adjustments over the course of 25 years that we were inevitably going to make. Uh, one of those adjustments is we originally put Veteran Stadium based on the priorities at the time and the condition of the stadium at the time. Um, we put it at the very end of the 2041 master plan. And even though you know, 80 plus million dollars sounds like a lot, we knew there'd be escalation and that $80 million at the end of a 2041 master plan would do um, you know, not more than lipstick, but it would be a, a renovation and not necessarily a new construction. Um, that was then, now with the spalling and the, the issues that we've had with the structural integ integrity, you know, we, we've looked at that and said, you know, are we going to be able to fix this with the money allocated? We, we are not going to be able to fix it in, uh, in a way that will continue to serve the community. Uh, and that's not, that has nothing to do with the Olympics. Um, the Olympics is more if you're going to build it, make it, NC, make it an NCAA track, which we currently don't have. You know, make it you know, potentially somewhere, you know, and I don't want to dangle the Olympics in front uh, as if that's like our decision tree. Uh, that would be just as far as timing wise, we'd like to get it done so that it's viable, but I don't want to make it sound like we're all in on the Olympics and that's why we're doing this. We're all in on Vet Stadium and the, re the reason why we're doing it is because we have to have it have the structural integrity that it can't get with the current budget um, in order to serve the community in the same way. So we'd have to reorganize and have it you know, serve the community in a different way if we were to scale down uh, based on what we originally you know, projected. And what about the housing piece for our students? Because that was the quintessential point for this whole discussion. Dr. Munoz? Thank you. I'll, I'll go ahead and respond to that. So. That is hopefully going to be part of the polling process. Um, when we had the conversation with the consultants who would be conducting the poll, polling, we would actually poll potential voters and ask them if there would be more support for this um, ballot measure if it was combined with housing or not. Um, I think, as you know, and we've, we've done other um, presentations, we did receive a planning grant under SB 169 that is um, that we're working diligently this year to be ready to resubmit, hopefully around October, for a construction grant. So I don't want to say we're going to get a construction grant, but I do. I will say we are positioning ourselves very well, and Vice President Drinkwine can respond more directly to some of the steps that we're taking to be competitive. Um, so. Hopefully, there'll be that opportunity to leverage those funds as well. And then, again, through the polling um, consultants, we should be able to have a better understanding if by pairing Vet Stadium with student housing, if that polls higher, then I think there's going to be an appetite to bring that information back to the board. If it polls lower, we would want to know that as well. So we've talked about the benefits of maybe putting forward a, a ballot measure that would have housing and vet stadiums combined, but we want to gather the information first to verify if, if that would um, increase the likelihood of, the, of this measure passing. And then speaking to the cost to the taxpayers, that's a very, they're a very important topic here, is one of the things that survey is going to do is not only determine how favorable different items are, but also tell us how uh, willing your tax base is to support a measure and how much they're willing to spend for it. And today, I'm able to give you estimates, but before you'd be asked to put a measure on a ballot, we'd be able to narrow this down, have that legal analysis done. So I'm going to go back to those estimates. If we did a $270 million authorization, the tax rate would range between $16 and $20 per $100,000 of assessed value. If we did a $285 million authorization, the tax rate would range between $17 and $21. And so as we work through this legal analysis, we'll be able to narrow that down and come with a definitive number, but we really need to do that tax exempt versus taxable analysis before we can do that, and we've just started that analysis. I would, I would add, Trustee, real, relative to, to your point in terms of appetite for additional assessment, there's been some changes to ballot law, California ballot law, that require that in the uh, ballot language that you specifically referenced, the amount of tax that will be applied. And so that's why the polling is so critical for us to be able to evaluate what that amount is and what the appetite is depending on the different amount. Um, in relation to, to the student housing, I can tell you that in our experience in our shop, uh, we are seeing in working with other parties and clients that student housing is polling significantly high. There is a general understanding that community colleges 
from the federal government's uh, communications and availability of funding from the state as well that they see community colleges having a special role in addressing housing insecurity for their student and faculty. And so we think that that combined with where um, the voters are and what likely will be on the ballot, this is a unique opportunity for us. And finally, what I'll mention is, is that we don't want to necessarily predetermine what we're going to get relative to that data. But we know that student housing was already an eligible expenditure as it relates to the existing bond money that is available. So there will be opportunities depending on what data we get if we focus on funding for the stadium that will have additional reserves to spend on other priority projects. We are at the eight minute mark for this questioning. So we'll take a pause and we'll go to the next trustee. And if there's time at the end, we can ask additional questions. Uh, Vice President Chico had her hand up next. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, what you all have uh, put together and considered. Uh, I like the fact that while we're not focused on the Olympics in 2028, that it's being considered because that is something important. I, I worked for a city uh, that is known for aquatics and when they built their new uh, pool, it wasn't uh, Olymp an, an Olympic size pool. And so they lost out on hosting a lot of tournaments, a lot of meets that need that regulation. Um, so I think that's really important when um, we as a college are being so competitive uh, and, and we're winning all these titles. I, I don't want us to uh, stop just short uh, because that's what that city did. It was just short, just short. Um, so thank you for, for considering uh, those things. Um, also, I think it's really smart to in include polling, uh, to, to find out, to get the temperature. Uh, I think we, you're right, we do know that there's a lot of support for student housing. Um, my question is, if, there, if we put this on the ballot and there is another bond measure for student housing, is that going to affect this here in Long Beach? And the reason why I say that is because I know the city, particularly Vice Mayor Rex Richardson, has talked about creating um, a partnership with the city, with LBUSD, with Long Beach City College, almost like a Long Beach housing promise so that we can identify students who are below the poverty line and they, they're the students that get uh, first access to housing. Um, so I know that they were talking about a bond as well, um, but I don't know where they are in those discussions. I would hate for there to be two bonds serving the same constituency and both of them fail. So are we going to be working with the city or other entities that could possibly be running a, a similar ballot measure? So if the city is running it, it would typically require two-thirds voter approval. So they have a bit of a higher hurdle than you would. Um, I think there should be some communication on that and determine what others are doing. That's one of the things, and we, I had not thought of this until you brought it up, so I'm glad that you did. But if we are getting a survey, this is one of the things that we should ask, is if there are other measures. Sometimes when you have like a, an elementary and a high school district on a ballot at the same time, they actually help each other because it looks like you're funding all K-12. Like that, that's, that's, but other times, when they don't necessarily have that same positive relationship, it actually hurts them both in the ballot. What we'd want to do is craft some of the language in that survey to help be able to answer that question. And I think we'd want to answer it in two ways. One is if it's a kind of viewed as a cooperative effort, does that help us or does the voters feel overwhelmed? And if we're viewed as competing with another entity, does that hurt, hurt us? It seems like it would, but we'd want to survey that to be able to answer the question. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, uh, I think I had all my questions answered. I was interested in, in the other potential ballot measures, what the parcel amount is. Um, it's good to know that we still have options uh, and that the polling and the research will give us either housing or standalone stadium uh, options. And I, I'm supportive of the effort and would and be interested to see uh, what the reports come back uh, in the future. So. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any other questions. I know there's some additional time and, or additional questions. I don't know if Dr. Munoz has any you're looking. 
So I just wanted to clarify for the board, what we're hoping to seek tonight is direction. So we're not asking you to vote on anything, but really kind of just give us a pulse check of, yes, we have the direction to move forward with continuing that next phase, which would be the engaging the polling consultant and the communications consultant, correct? As well as that analysis that Adam discussed. So that's essentially what we're um, seeking. And then also the timeline, right? That roadmap, right? That we would have the two additional um, special board meetings that would allow us to present the data so that we can meet the timeline should the board choose to authorize a resolution on um, placing a ballot measure on the November ballot. Um, so that's essentially what we're seeking is the direction tonight. And, and Dr. Munoz, we're separate agenda item. We're changing our meeting dates in July? Yes, so there is a, and, and that roadmap reflects I believe the tentative new date, or it might have the old date, and might get switched. I, there's, you know, I couldn't remember. I don't think we wanted to jump the, the horse. I don't want to jump a horse. I'm sorry, Trustee Chico. We would, you know, I didn't want to use the G word right now because of everything that's going on. So I tried to pick a different term, and I said horse, and that didn't come out right. So, <laughs> July 20th instead of July 27th. So it would be one week sooner that we would have our July meeting. And so I don't know how that fits in the timeline. Thank you, Trustee and, uh, and Superintendent. We will absolutely uh, update that roadmap. We think that even with that updated uh, date, we can absolutely meet it with the data uh, that we need and uh, present with ample time for deliberation. Great, thank you. I, I, had a, we'll go, I had one more question from Trustee Malu, and then we'll go back to Trustee Zia with our extra time. Tr Trustee Malu, can you still hear us? Or did yes, you, okay. did you get your I question answered? Go to Trustee Zia. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to take anything away from your presentation. I think you guys um, have done a fantastic job. Um, I have to be quite frank with you. I think it's pretty aggressive. I think the dollars and cents are pretty high, and I haven't heard a compelling argument that um, pivoting from P3 is warranted and for us to spend money to find out, and I don't think 500 may, may be a um, proper sample pool of the voters, um, especially since the legal analysis is pending. But I do, I just want to uh, punctuate that for the record. I, I'm not sold on this, um, but I am outnumbered. You, um, it seems like my colleagues are good, good uh, are okay with it. But if you do come back, I really want to see a the P3 option unpacked and uh, synthesized before I can make a, an informed decision um, and this option as well. Um, I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Munoz, I heard support from four. Do you, is there any additional information you need? I think I would just like a clarification. Um, so from Trustee Zia's request of seeing a P, I want to make sure I understand that correctly. Are you proposing that when we return in June and July with the additional information we want to also have information about P3 options? So you're asking for kind of a, a dual, I don't know if it's research process or, or essentially like a, due pro, a dual process. We put out that RFQ, I believe we, is what- We have the market analysis in our hip pocket that I briefed earlier. Um, I, I would. Think, think that if we execute that market analysis, which we were planning to do anyway, and we just do it now, that might not, might, it would bring the answers to the table of what the market appetite is for the P3, and it would be able to unwrap that that further. Uh, and we could we could get it started on that. So just to summarize, if the board, it's the pleasure of the board, we would do the market analysis, like you mentioned, for the P3, at the it, same it, time that we're collecting the data for the bond measure. The data applies to regardless of what delivery method, it would, it would be helpful. Okay, just to make sure I'm not um, miscommunicating, when I say P3, I want to get the examined approach from a, stand -up, a standpoint of pros and cons and to be able to see a benefit cost analysis based on whatever is the determination from the polling with the bond. Um, and I also want to say that 
it, this is one of my pet peeves when the issue of housing gets used in bonds and then the housing never comes through. So I want to follow through. If we're end, going to end up going with a bond, we better have housing for our homeless students because it's been seven years in the making since we started. Um, and I don't want to have any perfidy out there that we said something and didn't um, deliver. Thank you very much for the, for the feedback. I, I, I started uh, our presentation with the idea that the P3 opportunity is not mutually exclusive with uh, a ballot measure that would raise additional capital for the district. And so we'll take that into consideration. And we have, as was indicated by Michael, uh, an opportunity to proceed with the market analysis. So we'll do that. Thank you. Great. So, great. Well, thank you for the presentation tonight. Appreciate uh, everyone's contribution. We'll move on to our next uh, agenda item. We moved up 9.1, the Academic Senate uh, presentation on Task Force for Homeless, uh, sorry, Holistic Health and Safety Wellness Plan. We've got homelessness on the mind. This is a, a 15 minute presentation with uh, up to 25 minutes Q&A afterwards. And so we can queue up the, um, the PowerPoint. Okay, good evening, buenas noches. Um, so just for the sake of time, um, we're gonna forego introductions, um, but should the sound not be up to par, I'll go ahead and read the Academic Senate resolution. Okay, so just let us know um, if the sound quality is not to standard. So this is the uh, Senate resolution. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll read difficult. it. I'll read it. Okay. Um, so the title is Holistic Health and Safety Wellness Plan Resolution for the Academic Senate. Request to redirect campus um, safety funding in order to create a new holistic health and safety wellness campus plan to expand mental health resources, basic needs services, and professional learning through a restorative justice framework. Whereas racial justice practices were called for in a 2020 by the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, Com California Community College Chancellor's Office, and the Student Senate for California Community Colleges to address systemic racism by creating deliberate systems and supports to achieve and sustain racial equity through proactive and preventative measures. Whereas the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, the Long Beach City College Academic Senate, the Long Beach City College Faculty Association, and the Long Beach City College Board of Trustees passed similar resolutions regarding racial justice and anti-racism, establishing a commitment to take actionable, quote, steps to not only strive for a greater knowledge about the celebration of diversity, but also to support deeper training that reveals the inherent racism embedded in the societal institutions, including the educational system and ask individuals to examine their personal role in the support of racist structures and the commitment to the work to dismantle structural racism, end quote, AACC um, 2020. Whereas social justice movements and the impact of the pandemic are compelling the college uh, to reconceptualize ideas around public health, safety, and wellness. Given the impact of racial inequality, social isolation, economic disruption, and mental health stressors on our students and community, college-wide efforts are underway to create a culture of care in which the needs of the whole student are addressed and supported via basic needs such as food, housing, and technology. Whereas faculty want to collaborate in a college-wide effort to increase equity through education and awareness of the intersectionality of race, class, and gender as part of an ongoing program of inquiry, dialogue, data collection, and implementation to comprehensively and compassionately respond to 
issues, including student conduct, in a matter consistent with the holistic health and wellness plan. Whereas LBCC has 25,000 students and in 2,000 and 2,133 employees, for the most recent three years record reported from 2018 to 2020, there have been 37 on-campus criminal offenses, only three resulting in arrests. Whereas the Academic Senate LBCC Foundation and the New Strategic Plan support and champion a culture of care in supporting the overall health of students, yet the district's allocation of resources towards mental health personnel is disproportionate to these values and is only a tiny fraction of, the allocated, of that allocated to policing. Only three full-time clinicians, one part-time therapist, and two trainees for over the 20,000 students at Long Beach City College. Whereas Long Beach City College Board of Trustees will vote to either cancel, modify, or extend the approximately 3.6 million contract with the Long Beach City Police Department and has an opportunity to establish equitable practices focused on the intersectionality of race, class, and gender in creating a new campus safety plan centered on holistic wellness, care, and restorative justice. Resolved that the Long Beach City College Academic Senate through participatory governance and an in and pursuit of college mission, request that the Board of Trustees reevaluate the campus safety plan and redirect all or part of the approximately 3.6 million spent annually for the contract with the LBPD, 8 million over five years, to adequately fund student service programs that promote the well being of the whole student through expansion of basic needs, housing, and mental health services, including additional funding for the behavioral intervention team and additional dedicated full time clinicians. Resolve that the Long Beach City College Academic Senate, through participatory governance and in pursuit of the college mission, request that the Board of Trustees reevaluate the campus safety plan and redirect all or part of the approximately 3.6 million spent annually and that the contract with the LBPD, 18 million over five years, to create and fund an innovative, reimagined campus safety plan, including a dedicated office and staff, the plan should be rooted in the philosophical grounding in current research and data in the intersectionality of race, class, and gender expression through a restorative justice lens that elevates and champions the need of present and future LBCC students, especially in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility through courses and trainings for students, faculty, staff, administration, and management alike. Thank you. So that's our resolution from Senate. And then um, we're going to play the... Um, presentation for time's sake, and then I'll go ahead and go over some questions that we would like to pose for discussion. The Long Beach City College Academic Senate would like to share all three findings regarding campus safety with the Board of Trustees. Trustees in the community, as the college is currently focused on our strategic plan and a new mission that is focused on developing a campus environment that is caring, supportive, inclusive, diverse, equitable, accessible, and anti racist. The Academic Senate of California Community Colleges approved the use of the acronym IDEA to refer to inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. This term will be used throughout the presentation. The ways faculty and staff interact with students inside and out the outside the classroom affects student success and represents the culture of the college. This culture can draw students in or exclude them. Enrollment numbers at community colleges across the state have dropped precipitously. Students are struggling to cope in a world where the pandemic has disrupted every aspect of daily life. This struggle has resulted in adverse mental, physical, and financial health consequences for our students and their families. The most common problem for our students is depression, anxiety, and financial uncertainty. This presentation provides a short explanation of the current campus safety situation and some ways for the college to improve its financial stewardship, have a positive impact on student health and well being, and consequently increase retention and enrollment. 
This task force has identified four principal ways to address the challenges and to increase the overall well-being of students and employees via institutional changes, mental health and basic needs expansion, campus-wide professional development, and curriculum development. The institutional changes are to engage, redirect, fund, expand, and maintain. To engage is to use and engage in participatory governance to develop, draft, approve, and implement a holistic health and wellness safety plan with a restorative justice frame. Redirect. Redirect all or a portion of the current campus safety budget to fund, establish, staff, and maintain a community safety office to implement the holistic health and wellness safety plan. Fund, expand, and maintain behavioral intervention teams to include students and faculty. Rebrand these teams to care teams. We start with the current campus safety report. The data we use here is taken from the Long Beach Police Department report and represents three years from 2018 to 2040. This report is submitted to the Department, U.S. Department of Education, and it shows 27 criminal offenses on campus and 43 total incidents. These include offenses against people and property. There have been four Violence Against Women Act offenses at LAC in three years. It is worth mentioning that these statistics include extracurricular and non-college events, such as a swap meet, and not just students and classes. Still, there were only two arrests at LAC and just one arrest at PCC. Importantly, the incident on public property, which refers to the streets adjacent to the college, would be handled by the Long Beach Police Department in any case. Only a small number of the crimes in the report were crimes against people, which raises the question, how does district spending on campus safety reflect a proportionate response to the level and type of crime that is actually happening on campus? The police department contract is for $3.6 million a year. The student population is approximately 25,000, and there were 27 criminal offenses on campus and just 43 total incidents in the past three years. Although individuals may perceive a greater sense of safety when there is a high presence of campus police, is spending 10, over $10 million really serving our students when all surveys indicate a high rate of depression and anxiety among college-age students? What's more, when students have a mental health crisis on campus, there are currently only two resources for faculty and staff to use. Faculty can call armed emergency services. They can also refer to the handout called the Behavior Intervention Team Guide, Fit Guide. This is a list of ideas and suggestions to use when dealing with people in a mental health crisis. Neither faculty nor staff are trained in any other intervention practice. The resources are the police or the Fit Guide. How can faculty and staff support students in crisis with just these two tools. Our understaffed mental health services office has only three full-time licensed mental health providers. Their budget is inconsistent from year to year. In stark contrast, the district has contracted with the city of Long Beach to have 19 full-time Long Beach Police Department staff dedicated solely to the college at a cost of $3.6 million per year. When we look at the large number of requests for mental health services at the college and at the high incidence of college-age individuals with mental health issues in the U.S., and compare that to the number of crimes reported by the college to the U.S. Department of Education, we might ask ourselves whether we are applying our resources appropriately. How do we know if we're safe? Consultants were hired to conduct research on campus constituents regarding safety. The Senate is concerned about the rigor of the survey. With a campus community of over 25,000 individuals, the sample group was only about 620 participants, which equates to about a 2% response rate. Data collection occurred during a pandemic when many were not on campus. 
some focus groups were scheduled during flex day and final exams week. This scheduling discouraged participation. So how can we really know what perceptions of personnel and students are regarding campus safety? In sum, this is an inadequate data set to make conclusive, actionable decisions. How can we make the decisions with inconclusive information? How can additional and alternative data sets be used, like the number of students who use mental health services, or data from the Office of Student Conduct? According to the current police contract, LEPD is expected to provide many services in addition to patrols and crisis response, including resources for victims of sexual violence and employee training programs about sexual violence. However, the resources for victims of sexual violence are offered by the college and not by the police department. The training for faculty and staff is provided by a subcontractor and not the police department. How is it that $100,000 is spent on overtime for police services with such low levels of crime at the college? In what ways can we leverage these resources more effectively? How can we develop campus safety routines to expand beyond the current arrangement of just one safety officer, not a police officer, patrolling both campuses at night? In a survey in 2015, researchers question over 67,000 college students across 108 American colleges and universities about stress, depression, and anxiety. The results showed that one in four college students were diagnosed with a mental health condition, one in five considered taking his or her own life, nearly 10% admitted to attempting suicide, and almost 20% had committed self-harm of some form. Our research and analysis suggests that there are numerous ways to support student health and well-being and consequently increase persistence and enrollment numbers. The district could earmark more generous funding for student health needs, including physical, mental, and financial health support and services, as it researches and analyzes a robust and innovative approach to protecting camp the campus community. We urge the Board of Trustees to reflect on and consider the Senate's resolution for campus safety, as well as the updated language of Title V being proposed by the Chancellor's Office to delineate an evidence-based campus safety model to be developed by community college stakeholders that clearly and transparently articulates budget and fund allocations and the establishment of restorative justice programs based on inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you so this much. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Heather, 15 minute time. This is an opportunity for board members who would like to ask questions. Trustee Zia. Thank you for such a great presentation. I appreciate your work and um, your perspective. Um, I just want to better understand um, uh, two things. One, is this the um, position of the entire faculty? And two, what are you recommending? I see the, there's quite a bit of daylight between the different options of canceling, improving, and I think um, the last option, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the canceling, improving, and redirecting, I think, is the uh, language you're using. So it's quite quite broad. So if you can um, unpack that for me, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. The senators that we have in Academic Senate are elected by the entire body of the faculty to represent all faculty. Um, so the senators that are there are the senators that are there deciding to make the decisions with the faculty body as a whole. I hope that makes sense. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to the people who have really been in the trenches doing this work, these individuals behind me. Um, you know, this, this task force was created back in fall of 2021 in order to look at how we might want to not necessarily redirect all the funds, but look at how we look at policing on campus as a whole and how we might want to look at, instead of funding the entire police contract, 
but looking at some of that funding for some of the mental health needs of our students and our faculty and staff on campus. Because one thing that we know is that coming out of this pandemic, mental health has become more prevalent and more important than ever. And I'll say on my behalf, as somebody who has health insurance, it is difficult to find a therapist. So for our students, I cannot imagine how difficult it might be for them to have one or two clinicians on campus compared to having 19 police officers when they might have a mental health crisis. So that's really where we're coming from. I hope that helps answer that question. So what do you recommend if we have, an, uh, God forbid, the situation in Texas, if we have an active shooter, what do we do? Are you suggesting we cancel the police contract and not have no, armed officers? No, so number one, there's no data that supports that having campus police prevents any shooting. Um, so that's, yeah. And, and number two, we can still have some sort of policing, but we don't want what has happened is that in the past, DSPS or faculty or classified have called, and the only option is to call the police. And we need some sort of a MET team. We need people on here to help de-escalate and help um, our students because they're in crisis and we can have police we don't necessarily need them to have an office on campus 3.6 million per year that's that's a lot of money that could be partially diverted to our underfunded mental health um, student services Does that make sense yeah. yeah it absolutely makes sense I just uh, don't see how we can't augment our contract with mental health support services, and I think that's a, a I share your position, but um, I have gotten quite a bit of um, emails speaking against this resolution that this is not the faculty's position. So that's why I ask why uh, is this is this speaking for the entirety of the faculty? Um, and I appreciate the response that Suman gave. It's just a reminder that the Senate is a democratic process, so it's a numbers game. So not everybody gets represented in the people that 10% don't get represented. It's representative democracy. Um, I, I don't know the tenure of, of everyone on the dais, um, but I've, I'm a part-time faculty member here at Long Beach City College, and I've been on, uh, I think I'm in my 21st year, I believe. And so I know that we didn't always have a contract with the Long Beach Police Department. We, uh, prior, I don't remember when it changed, but um, I know that prior to that we had our own campus safety officers, and so we're envisioning a program that would be along those lines, excuse me, but expanded uh, with a campus, our own campus safety officers, an expanded care team or behavioral intervention team, and um, also some kind of um, program for the those of us many many of whom are part-timers who work in the evening hours um, to have some kind of uh, security escorts to our cars especially if we're parked um, maybe in the structure here on this campus so that's what we're envisioning is not eliminating any kind of campus safety program but uh, redir redirecting some or all of that money We actually had some questions um, that we brought with us. Would it be, could we put them overhead on the projector again? I mean, in addition to the time or? Uh... We, um, if you want to share the slide that has the questions, we can, we have a couple other queued up trustees for yeah, questions. These are just yeah. points of consideration when the board is looking at um, the different um, sort of offerings. And I wanted to reiterate that this is the stance of the Academic Senate, which is representative of the faculty body, and we are all appointed um, and voted, um, obviously, from our constituents. So another thing I'd like to add, um, if there are no other questions, um, we, unless we, there we, are, yes, 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 yeah, yes. We'll stop at that. This Five minute time yes. for Trustee Zia. I have Trustee Blackman, Vice President Chico, and uh, Dr. Baxter, and we still have Trustee Malulu yes. on the phone. I will go to Trustee Blackman.
Thank you, Board President. Um, thank you all so much for your wonderful presentation. I don't have any questions, more some few comments. Um, I think it's very important, as you all mentioned, that we don't have very many mental health clinicians on campus. That's very huge because, especially during these times, um, we need those you know, services here on campus and we have basically one for every 10,000 students. So um, they can get very backlogged with you know, having to do so much work. And if a student has a mental health crisis you know, right now, not being able to reach out to the people who are here to help us is very detrimental to you know, our success here. So I agree with what you all say about that as well. Um, and I know myself and a few other members of our ASB have been very vocal about this as well too. And it's not, again, it's not canceling or taking all the money away from the contract. Um, and I think that's a misunderstanding sometimes that people do get, but it's really just you know, reimagining how we can maybe divvy up this money a little bit differently um, to put it in some other areas as well too. And then having that community um, and that campus policing here as well too, I think would be a huge difference for a lot of our students who may not feel comfortable seeing LBPD on campus every day. Um, you know, we have a lot of our, you know, system impacted students on campus and, you know, unfortunately the relations between police department and some of those students is not so great. Um, I know I talked to a few students about that as well too, and it just doesn't feel, I know they're here to protect us as, you know, and all that good stuff, but it doesn't feel safe sometimes still. Um, if I'm walking on PCC, you know, late night by myself, or if I don't even have my backpack or anything, you know, um, and I'm just in sweats and a hoodie, you know, it just, I don't feel safe, honestly. Personally, I just do not feel safe. Um, but even though the cop is there, I just I do not feel safe. It's just a weird feeling. Um, and I think that there's still more that we can do as well to, you know, help bridge those um, disconnections and everything. But I just hope that there's more ways that we can start, you know, seeing how we can think more holistically into this. And I understand that there's a lot of crazy things going on right now in the world. And, you know, we wonder how this can be stopped. But um, there has been instances, you know, in Parkland, for example, when there was their mass shooting and what did the police do there? So, you know, not to discredit anyone, you know, not to say there's anything wrong with the police department. I'm just saying think of other ways um, to start thinking of how we can really think about our students. Um, I'm very happy that the Academic Senate were able to come together. I wish our ASB could have done the same because I know we would have had the same stance from talking to so many members. Um, but just please remember, you know, to keep the students and what, you know, we want and kind of how, you know, the campus belonging feels for us um, in mind when thinking about the contract and, you know, reimagining ways for um, safety on campus. Thank you, Vice President Chico. Thank you for that very informative presentation. There was a lot of really good information in there. Um, sadly, it's timely, right? Uh, again, um, I think that uh, student trustee uh, Blackman has a very good point about listening to what our students have to say and how they feel here. Um, I do, though, want to commend uh, Long Beach PD in their efforts to try to um, embrace more of a community policing outside of, you know, the campus. Um, I've seen that within the community and they've made great strides and, and I think that that's important. I think that also shows that they're open to um, working with us to come up with something that is a good balance. Um, I agree with you. I think that we do need more clinicians. I think the focus should be on mental health. My question, though, is have we looked at the impacts of the 988 a mental health crisis line that is coming online in July? That is a national mental health line, so it's not 911 anymore that everybody's gonna have to call. There's somebody experiencing a mental health crisis, the number beginning in July is gonna be 988, nationally. That's nationally. And we already know that um, there's gonna be some uh, challenges because we simply do not have enough clinicians in the country to address uh, all of the calls that they're anticipating. So I understand, I, I think you're absolutely right. I hear what you're saying. I just, I guess I'm trying to figure out how you're suggesting we get there. Because there are some things that we're going to have to consider, like the uh, onboarding of 988 that's gonna start in July. And that may take this in a completely different direction, right? So do you have any uh, information on the consideration for 988 and additional clinicians at all? No, we do not. And um, we feel that 
you know, that, that's a national um, situation and that's a national resource. That's wonderful, right? There are currently resources out there in the community for mental health, but here on campus, we lack them, right? And faculty and students lack those resources. And so we're focused on what we can do here on mm -hmm. campus to mm -hmm. support our students. And we too commend the police department on, you know, revamping their, um, their policies mm -hmm. in regard to the community. That's wonderful. But we feel that here on, in our community, mm -hmm. we can do a lot more to revamp our policies. Mm -hmm. And we can work collaboratively with everybody on campus to come up with those policies. We do not have the, all the answers. Mm -hmm. What we would like to do is work with all the constituencies on campus to come up with those. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, I, I agree, like I, I, I hear you about more uh, capacity here on campus. Just know that the 988 is a national line, I, but it's gonna be just like 911, where we're gonna use it, it's supposed, that's what it's supposed to be, right? It's, it's 911 and 988. So if we are on campus and we see that somebody is maybe having a mental health crisis, rather than calling 911, we would call 988. And then that's the response. Then we receive a response that way. I know it's going to ha we're going to we're going to change. We're going to have to get used to it. But it's a new program that we're going to we're going to have. Nine eight eight. It's going to be all over. LA County is already implementing it. Are you saying that that would uh, prevent us from um, developing other? resources on campus? No, what I'm saying is that we have to, we have to include all of these resources, right? So this is now something that we have to consider as maybe another tool in the toolbox. What is that going to look like? Because when we're talking about a team that responds from 988, they want it to look different than a response from 911, right? So the response from 988 is supposed to be with a clinician. Uh, so again, it, it's supposed to be online in July. We know what it's supposed to look like. Whether or not that's what happens when it's rolled out, we'll see. I know that there's going to be glitches, but I think that's something that we need to consider moving forward because there, everybody's talking about addressing mental health and increasing um, uh, services and programs. So that's just one other thing. I think we should just make sure that is on our radar. Um, and, and if we hear of anything, or if I hear of anything else, I'll be sure to kind of pass it your way. But we got to look regionally as well, even though we want to be very specific. There's, there may be other opportunities to leverage our resources, so we're not the only ones doing this. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention, because we did not know about that. Um, but we do know that over at Cal State Long Beach, they're implementing new policies, and so there are models for us to follow and to look at. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Dr. Baxter. Yeah, thank you. Just for your history, Bob Q with a flashlight guarded this entire campus. But what happened was, with his flashlight, he could not do what he was supposed to do. So Jan Kehoe was the president who um, uh, brought on the, the Long Beach PD. And Jan who was president 20 years ago, quite, quite a while ago. Um, so we, uh, this is not something that's, that's you know, brand new. A uh, couple other things I just wrote. Um, uh, president Entuck and um, Trustee Malaulu are on a task force. And I don't know if you've had any public presentations or anything like that, but don't you have an ad hoc committee? for the police? We do, we have had presentations yeah. and we have an upcoming meeting. Okay, yeah. So what I'm getting at is they are a resource to you so that you let, you know, you let them know how the faculty feel. Um, I know we have psychologists on campus. I agree with you, we probably don't have enough. Uh, but that is a step forward. And again, years ago, it was a nurse, half time, was a psychologist, only at LAC. So if you had a problem, you had to get in your car and drive up here if you were at PCC. Um, how many senators are there in the Academic Senate, total? There are 36 senators. 36, okay. Thank you. 
Okay, and then I have, um, and by the way, um, I'm on the board of the CCEJ, which started the idea of restorative justice. And I truly believe in restorative justice. And I don't know how involved we are on campus with, with uh, that situation. But I think the, the police are dealing with more, um, not petty things, but big issues. And um, uh, several meetings ago, I can't remember, Trustee Zia, uh, uh, she brought up, and I agreed with her, that uh, there was a student on campus who was harassed by the police. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that I signed the um, uh, uh, reconciliation uh, Framework, framework, frame, thank you. Framework for reconciliation. This gentleman did nothing wrong. He, uh, but uh, he came on campus and he wasn't a student and, and the police did rough him up. Uh, when I said I had coffee with a cop, and by the way, no one from, there were people there from Long Beach PD primarily, they worked the Metro um, line. They had no relationship with the college. But when I complained to two of the police officers about this student unnecessarily being roughed up and actually taken to jail and eventually released, they said, well, somebody had to call us. We just don't walk around looking for people and say, let's arrest this person or let's pick on this person. And so I wonder if more, more should be done working also on campus within the campus system, because I do know teachers who have been harassed by students, um, and uh, uh, and there did not appear to be um, closure on what to do. Uh, luckily, and I taught for a long time, uh, I never had a student threaten me or or anything like that uh, while I was in the classroom. But I know it it occurs, and so I I think all these all these things you're bringing up are really important. Um, but I think more needs to be studied, and I loved. Your four questions, they took it off. But how? I think those questions need to be addressed because I think they're very valid uh, if we indeed are paying for these things. And, um, uh, you know, um, and I, I do know we pay for walkie-talkies, part of the, the police vehicles and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's a good idea to look at the contract before we renew it. And so I appreciate you bringing this forward and... Um, uh, and I know it took a lot of time for you to put all this Steve together, Baxter. so I appreciate it. Six minutes. I'm done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Malulu on the phone. Do you have any questions? Can you hear us? Hearing none. I, I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation, Sorry. for going. Oh, you got it, Dario? There you go. No, we could not. Now we can. Can you hear us? I was, I was totally talking and you interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. The floor is yours. No, just, I just wanted to say thank you and I appreciate the work. Uh, LBCC is very fortunate to have a strong academic senate that really truly does step up and get involved and represent its members. And um, even though not everyone always agrees, you know, there, there are differences of opinion. I think that the information is presented in such a way where people do feel heard and respected. Um, Trustee Untuck and I do continue to work on this. Um, we do have a meeting pending and uh, we are receiving material and information. So it, it's not something that um, is being taken lightly. So your input is definitely valued. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Malulu. Uh, echoing those sentiments, thank you. Um, I think it's really important we go through the shared governance process and we have representatives such as yourself present a uh, different point of view. And I think it's a very diverse group here uh, tonight that's sharing and appreciate the time and effort, especially including students in the process. Um, I know it's a difficult topic. Uh, one question I did have was, can you talk a little more about what is the chancellor's office uh, related to the Title V delineation of evidence-based campus safety model. It's in the um, yeah, slide 12. Gonna talk, she's going to talk. Okay. Subject. Uh, and while she's looking for it on her phone, can I just uh, 
clarify here that uh, we want to participate and collaborate and offer ideas to the board because it is the board who's actually hiring the contractors and using the information and making the decisions. So this is an informational item and this is, we want to give you these questions so these are the questions you can take into your meetings and in your decision making. We appreciate that. And this is a collaborative nature that by you coming forward with this agenda item, it's bringing enhanced public transparency and discussion this is online, the slides, I mean, the information is on the board docs for other people to view. Uh, and so it's, you're elevating the conversation by bringing this forward. You, you ready, Sue? I am <laughs> trying to find the document and it's not downloading if, on my phone. No worries. So how about this? Can, can I up. email that document yeah. to you so you can take a look at it and I can send it to everyone here? That would be great. And you great. can take a look at what the Chancellor's Office is proposing in Title V for campus safety. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And just to share, we did have a presentation last month from the, uh, what are the KSI, no, 21CP. Uh, we have not received their report yet. We anticipate this week or next week getting the draft report, and that'll be coming back and also be informative. They gave a very high level presentation last, I believe it was last month, uh, they'll be coming. And Dr. Munoz, we're going to be issuing a request for proposal, so it'll be a normal contracting process in the future. I'll have um, Vice President Drinkwine speak directly to what the procurement process would look like for a contract. Yes, thank you. So we um, have already contracted with 21CP. The submittal of their final report will conclude the current contract we have. That report will contain recommendations for the board's consideration and dependent upon what recommendations the board adopts, that would start another procurement process in order to achieve those recommendations. My understanding, and not to preview the report because I myself have not yet seen it, I'm basing this on the presentation from last month, is that there are a great many different recommendations that attack the issues from several different angles. So again, very timely uh, presentation. I know we're at the end of our time for this agenda item, and again, wanna say thank you, and please feel free to email the entire board follow-up, especially I think there was another PDF that had the questions on it. We didn't have a, yes, a copy I, of that. That, that. Somehow it wasn't submitted, but I, it will be. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And then we can also post that the board docs for the public that they can go back on this agenda item and see that as well. Thank, Thank you, you all for, very much for your attention. Yes. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Move, moving um, on the agenda now to, we got to jump back. We're going back to section six. This is Board of Trustees areas. Uh, we have a number of resolutions, uh, appointments, schedule change. So 6.1 is an action item. This is our um, monthly authorization of teleconference open meetings pursuant to AB 381. This is a, a, a recommendation or action item. The board adopt resolution 052522A authorizing telecom uh, meetings um, for the next 30 days. And I'll need a motion and a second to move forward on this item. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on this? Seeing and hearing none, uh, we'll call for a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? The ayes have it, the resolution is adopted. Moving forward to item 6.2, this is another um, resolution, it's an action item. It's a resolution ordering the biennial governing board elections for November. Uh, this is attached is a copy of the resolution. It's recommending the board of trustees to drop resolution 052522H, ordering biennial governing Board of Elections, Trustee Areas 1, 3, 5, on November 8, 2022, and setting forth the specification of the election as submitted. And this will go to uh, the LA County Office of Education as well as the County Registrar Recorder's Office. We'll need a motion and a second for this item. So moved. Second. Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on this item? I have a question. Question from Trustee Zia? So is it safe to assume the only change from previous resolutions is that we've changed it to a November election and then December for officer elections? 
Dr. Munoz? I think understand. The, the question is that if we're changing the, we're changing it to align with the November election? Yeah, because there's um, timelines specified, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and then for the three trustee areas, and then it will get um, codified, I guess, within um, the second Friday of December, as far as their uh, term start date. Is it commensurate with what we've done in the past, with the exception that it was April, July, sure. and now it's November, December? Just for and I'll, I'll defer to Michelle, because I know Michelle was working with the county office, and the elector's office, so, excuse me. Correct, it's just a um, protocol resolution that the county asks for when we go into the election and they send us a sample and I've looked at our past and we just adjusted the dates um, correlating with the new November election dates, yes. Perfect, yeah, so it's better than before because previously we had, the election was April and then the assumption of office uh, was two months later, so it was kind of anticlimactic for the yeah, trustees, but, so yeah. it's second Friday. The assuming December. the office second Friday is Friday. correct. Mm -hmm. That's the distinction. Okay, great, thank you. And, and then Dr. Moon, so I guess a second question, this, uh, this doesn't explicitly have anything to do with officer elections, that's already. Yeah, that was my mistake, I'm sorry. Okay, didn't, I didn't hear it. Yeah, I, I saw December and then it just uh, triggered that in my mind that that's our officer elections, you're right. No problem. Great. Any other discussion on the item before we vote? Seeing and hearing none, we'll, we'll do a, a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstention? abstentions? All right. The resolution is adopted. Moving to the 6.3 resolution, this is an accompanying resolution and an action item uh, that has to do with candidate resolution, I mean, candidate statements. Uh, for governing board members for November 8, 2022. This is an action item recommends the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 052522I pertaining to candidate statements for November 8, 2022 governing board elections as submitted. There's an attached draft of the resolution. We need a motion in a second. So moved. Second. A motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussions on the resolution? Yeah, I just have the same question. So it's consistent with the past um, confines or constraints of the words 200, and then we can change it to 400? Correct, it's at the discretion of the board, but the history has been 200 words per candidate statement. Right, okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing and hearing none, we'll go to uh, uh, voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The resolution is adopted. Moving on to 6.4. This is appointments and reappointments to the Citizens Oversight uh, Committee. This is for our Bond Oversight Committee. This is also an action item. It's recommended that the Board of Trustees appoint uh, David Chang and Chris Fowler for the terms of May 26, 2022 to June 30th, 2024, and reappointment of Rebecca Turpentine and Summer Temple for the terms of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024 to the Citizens Oversight Committee as submitted. This is an um, action item that will need a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Baxter, second by Vice President Chico. Any discussion on these appointments? Seeing hearing none, we'll, we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? The appointments are ratified. Moving on to our next item, uh, 6.5. This is a revised 2022 board meeting schedule. Uh, attached is, uh, this is also an action item that we'll need to vote on. Uh, in the, the agenda summary has the listing but it's a recommendation that the, we revise the uh, board meeting schedule as submitted for, sorry, my uh, computer's jumping back and forth. It would change the July meeting from July 27th to July 20th this summer, and our October 26th meeting to October 19th. And this is due to scheduling conflicts. Uh, I'll need a motion and a second to adopt. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter, any discussion on the schedule? 
I just want to, um, I know it's been peripherally mentioned, but what's the basis for the change? Okay. Thank you. So we, bringing for, we, we brought forward a recommendation for two changes, one for the month of July and one for the month of October. For July, the July 27th meeting uh, conflicts with um, the Aspen's president, Rising President's Fellowship that I participate in. And so, um, and obviously that was something the board supported my participation in. And so, in order for me to be able to attend the board meeting, I'm asking for the consideration for the date change for July 20th. And then as far as the October um, meeting, there's probably two two points to, to make in terms of consideration. The first point is the ACCT Leadership Congress. Typically, we do send a delegation of the board and myself attends that conference. And so, in order to not create that conflict, um, that's one consideration. The other is that the September board meeting is moved up because of the adoption of the budget, mm -hmm. as well as the November meeting is moved up because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So what does that mean? If we leave the original October 26th meeting, there would only be two weeks between the October meeting and November meeting, which from a board pep perspective and everything that goes into building the agenda and the timeliness of that, that's not a good thing. And then if you look at that, the September meeting is moved up to early September, that puts a six week um, gap if we leave it on October 26 between the September meeting and the October meeting. So there's two factors that um, went into this recommendation. So we'll, instead of parceling them out, we thought it made sense to just bring the recommendations for both of these um, considerations at once. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Trustee Baxter? Mantec? Yep, uh, let's, let's go to um, Trustee Malulu and then we'll go to Dr. Baxter. Trustee Malulu? We, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I have always been in favor of moving the October meeting up at least one week, maybe two weeks, because the September budget meeting has to happen before a certain deadline. Our budget has to be submitted. So I don't know if you recall, but we have had discussions uh -huh. to move the October meeting up so that there isn't a six-week September, October, and then a very quick two-week turnaround to the November meeting, but it just never materialized. So I am in favor of that meeting being moved up, and I think it should have been moved up before. With regard to the July meeting, um, I just want to make sure, um, even though I am going to vote um, in favor of both of these, I do have to leave that July meeting early because I have to be at an ACCT board, national board the following day, so I'm actually going to be on a red eye instead of me flying out on the 20th during the day and calling in remotely to the meeting, I'm staying and taking a red eye, but I do have to leave that meeting early, so I know it's still three months away, but or two months away, but I want to make sure that uh, before we vote as a board to approve that meeting change, my colleagues on the board are aware that I am going to have to leave that meeting early to get to the airport that evening for Red Eye. So, so that it's not a problem that night when I have to leave. Thank you, we'll take note of that. Dr. Baxter? And yes, and I may have a conflict, uh, but as you have always told me, I can call in. <laughs> Just is. like, are you having fun talking on the phone Trustee Malaulu, is it hard? Actually, I can see you guys. <laughs> oh, oh. If you, guys, if, you, if you lift up one hand, I'm going to tell you, because I call you right now. Okay. No, no, don't say anything. Okay. Okay. Darn, you guys are Make sure 
and I will be remote on July 20th. Will that be a problem if two of us are remote? I think it'll only be a problem if we have, you know, as long as there's three there and there's a okay. quorum, I think that'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, as long as we have a quorum in person, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. Michelle, yeah? Yeah, I, I, think, even, <laughs> I think it even waives the quorum under the revised, oh. but I'll double check. All right. Well, good. Any other discussion before we vote on amending the uh, two months, July and October? Seeing and hearing none, let's take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? The new schedule is adopted. Moving to item 6.6, .6. this is a campus reopening update. This is an information item. It's an executive summary that's attached as the PDF that's four pages about uh, getting ready for summer and fall, uh, enrollment changes, uh, status of vaccines, student support services, and next steps. Dr. Munoz, do you have anything to add to this information item? No, this is just consistent with our monthly um, executive summary that's provided to the board regarding our reopening updates. And so we always are um, available to answer any questions during the board meeting, or if you have a follow-up question, you can feel free to email myself directly, and I'll get you the appropriate response. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next section seven, uh, the consent agenda. 7.1, any, any item may be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately if a member of the board of trustees so wishes. Uh, maximum time of discussion, items removed uh, from the consent should not be more than 25 minutes uh, without approval or extension by the majority of the board. Uh, is there any items um, in the consent agenda that goes one point, or sorry, 7.1 through 7.17? 7 7.3. Excuse me? I'd like to pull 7.3. 7.3, purchase order ratification. Any other items? Be able to get it, Michelle? Moving to item 7.2, uh, the approval of the consent agenda. All agenda items are listed under consent agenda may be acted upon at one motion of approval. Uh, this we will need. A, this is actually I will need a motion, but the motion should be amended to say adoption of the consent agenda except for 7.3. So moved. I, I apologize, um, President and Tuck. I I forgot to pull another one. 7.7. .7. Forgive me. I missed that one. 7.3 and 7.7. .7. So I move to um, accept the consent or approve the consent calendar with the exception, and, but pulling 7.3 and 7.7. .7. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Baxter. So motion by Vice President Chico, second by Dr. Baxter. Any discussion on the remaining consent agenda items? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda is adopted. Moving back to item 7.3, this is purchase order ratification. This is an action item. It is uh, recommended that the Board of Trustees ratify the purchase orders and changes orders issuance for the period of April 2nd, 2022 through April 29th, 2022 in the amount of 4 million $341,582.48 as submitted. There's a current PO activity uh, PDF attached um, to the item. We'll need a motion in a second to move forward. So moved. Second. Motion by Vice President Chico, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on this? Yes, I. Um... Trustee Zia? Yes, I will be uh, abstaining from this item because of the legal fees that have been used, legal contracts that have been used again uh, for a lawsuit that was brought by members of this board against me. So um, again, I will vote to abstain on this item. Any other discussion on this item? Members of the board having filed a lawsuit against her 
and that's very misleading to the public because it was the district that actually filed the lawsuit against her, not members of the board. And when such statements are said and that they're quoted in the press, it really misleads people. It causes defamation of character. You know, it's slander. So I just want to make sure that we use the correct language. Um, it, you know, I, unless I'm wrong, unless individuals on the board did file a lawsuit against Trustee Zia, I read the paperwork and it was actually the district. So please let the record show that language. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question for board council. Uh, in the instances of a trustee extension, are they supposed to also not comment on the item as well as not voting? Or is it you're giving up your ability to abstain when you participate in the discussion of the item? My understanding is that they do not participate in the discussion of the item. Okay. All right. Any other discussion on this item? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Secretary Reese, can we do a roll call vote, please? Student Trustee Blackman. Oh. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Herlinda Chico. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Abstain. All right, the purchase order, uh, order is ratified. Moving to item 7.7, .7, bond contract amendments. This is also an action item. It's a recommendation of the Board of Trustees authorized Vice President of Business Services or designee to enter into and execute a bond contract amendment as submitted. There are one, two um, amendments submitted with the original contract uh, or agreement and then the amendments on them. This is a motion that we'll need, a, or actually we'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Did we skip second. 7.4? It was regular consent. The only two pulled from consent was 7.3 and 7.7. 7.4 should have been oh, ratified with the previous I'm overall sorry. consent agenda. <laughs> so. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> It's only like nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm overthinking it, sorry. <laughs> so I, I have a motion from Vice President Chico and a second from Trustee Baxter on contract uh, amendments uh, or adoption of these um, con bond contracts as amended by the Vice President of Business Services. Any discussion on that? Yeah, I, um, I have examined the information provided here. Um, and I've said this many times, I think we need to do a better job of soliciting for giving companies an opportunity to bid on our projects um, and propose on our uh, consulting contracts uh, rather than just amending the same ones. In this case, Amendment 2 is more than doubling the original value. It's going from one point seven million to 4.1 million. And then in addition, there's another amendment, amendment number three, that's gonna add another 200 and approximately $250,000. I think these are opportunities that we can provide to um, small businesses or other firms and provide more equity and diversity and inclusion within the contracting community. I've said this many times, uh, I think we need to practice what we preach on contracting front as well when it comes to diversity and inclusion and equity. So I will be voting no on this item. Vice President Rinkman, anything in response? The cause for these amendments is because we have expanded the scope of this building. Um, we discussed this at the special meeting we had when we discussed the priorities for the bond funding. The expansion of the student services building here was largely to accommodate an expansion of space for new programs for students. So we're talking about a family center, first year experience, we're adding an eSports, as well as meeting space. It's a really exciting project, but because this 
project itself has about doubled in size. It was necessary to increase the fees we pay to our architects because their work has now doubled. There are two amendments. The first is for the designs for the building itself. The second is for the design of the swing space that we remove students and other services that are currently residing in Building E, we need a design space where they can then move to. It's an especially challenging project because it contains our cafeteria, and so we have to explore unique ways to house the cafeteria. I would be remiss if I didn't include a discussion about the expansion of the Viking Vault, the Basic Needs Center, as well as exploration uh, different unique ways to better serve our students with having a more retail experience when we're having some of the clothing vault experiences as well as training kitchens that are attached to that. Thank you, Marlene, for that explanation. But this is standard scope and cost creep that should be bid out, and I appreciate you expanding on it because it proves my case in point. Thank you. Vice President Drinkman, did we do a, a bid out for this originally? We followed our typical procurement process for architects. HPI is one of our architects that we have on our bench. So we have a bench of firms for which we do follow a procurement process. And so that procurement process can change depending on whether we're talking about a professional service or whether we're talking about a low bid environment. But I will say that we've used HPI on other projects very successfully. I will also correct my misstatement. I said project two was for, spring, was for swing space. It is not. It is to create a second food service area in the courtyard of LAC on the north side of Clark. So we have, we commonly refer to it as the hut, that we have that free um, standing building. That will become a pavilion that will serve as both coffee as well as sandwiches. It will serve as swing space when we have to close down cafeteria operations, but it will continue to serve on an ongoing basis so students won't have to just enter into building E and make their way to the cafeteria. They can address it more quickly. So I wanted to expand on that answer. It's not just swing space. It will be served as swing space, but it will remain on a consistent and permanent basis. I have a question. Uh, one, one question for Trustee Baxter. So if we vote this down, all of those things you just described would not happen right now, or it would be a That's modified correct. It, it, um, If we did not approve the expansion of this contract, the designs would be limited to the original scope of the project, um, not reflect the board's direction to expand the project, and would not provide for the additional um, food service area. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Oh, Dr. Munoz? And I know Vice President Chigwine just mentioned this, but I do want to remember, you gave, a, the board gave us staff board direction to move forward with expanding the scope for the student union when we had our retreat last summer and we went over the update. So this isn't something that us, you know, an executive team, we went on our own. We presented this all to you as an option and the direction was given and the support was given to expand the scope for the student center building. And so this is just the next natural next steps of that expansion. Great, uh, Trustee Baxter. I I had a question about the building. Uh, right now, technically, the building uh, E is a three-story because they have a lower level. Um, Beverly O'Neill would never allow us to use the word basement. Uh, it was lower level. So is the new building going to be the same concept, a lower level and two stories, or is it going to be three stories like the uh, B building? It will be a traditional three-story building. Okay. The basement or lower level would not be replaced. So in this concept, we'd have a traditional three-story building all at ground level and above. Uh, and by the way, I'm totally in favor of this because most people don't know that there was a serious mold problem because it was subterranean and subject to floods and uh, different things like that. So this, this is much better. Thank you. Thank you for the responses. Let's take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? The ayes have it and the amendments are adopted. Moving on to our next section, eight, human resources. 
8.1 is personnel commission annual budget 2022-2023. Um, this is, I guess, a concurrence, which we do need to vote on. Or no? Well, the, the, the type here is different. <laughs> I think we need to vote to concur. I would say we should take a vote. Okay. <laughs> I'm not 100 percent sure. I feel like but all I the feel items like I've been that through. Would be the safer I've never seen yeah, concurrence as a, a rec <laughs> Well, what does our board council think? Since we don't have a parliamentarian, I'm sorry, okay. with concurrence votes, is it a vote for concurrence? What's on the item? No, it would be. So there's no vote needed. Gotcha. Thank you. That would have to be action. Oops, may I respond? I believe that the concurrence, the type that was listed, it was listed in error, should have been a vote, right? I'm assuming, is that what, no? It's, it, is it, it is how it has previously been on board agendas. I did not have time to preview previous meetings to see how the vote went. My apologies. I think we did have a vote because I remember discussing uh, the budget. We, we did have a, a vigorous debate pre-pandemic on the Personnel Commission uh, budget, I guess maybe that was three years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I, I do recall us voting on the budget, but this is our annual budget from the Personnel Commission, right? Yes. Marlene? I can actually provide an answer to this in my role at, with the LA County Office of Education. I was responsible for accepting the Personnel Commission budgets from all the school districts within the county. The board's role is to concur with the Personnel Commission budget. If the board chose to reject it, then that would initiate a public hearing process that LACO would then conduct. LACO's um, only response to that would be if the district rejected it would to be to place the prior budget in place. But it is a concurrence. Okay. Thank you. Great. I know we pr previously have had someone from the Personnel Commission come, and I know there's a change in the interim director is now uh, Philip Gordillo, correct? It was Carrillo. Philip Correa. Huh? Well, I, I, on here, Gordillo. Philip Gordillo? It's Gordillo. Gordillo, Gordillo correct. Okay. Any... Um, any further discussion on, there's an attached presentation, the document that needs to be signed. Um, I guess if we take no action, then it still will proceed to LACO. Is that correct, Marley? Okay. Any, any other discussion, questions on the Personnel Commission budget? All right, let's move on, we concur. Going to 8.2, Equal Employment Opportunity Fund Multiple Methods Allocation Certificate. Uh, this is uh, an action item. It's recommended the Board of Trustees approve the Equal Employment Opportunity Fund Multiple Method Allocation Certificates as presented um, since 2015 as a statewide EEO and Diversity Advisory Committee identified nine best practices for area success in promoting EEO. These nine areas now serve as what's called multiple methods for allocations of the EEO fund. And this is uh, the qualify for fiscal year 22-23 uh, funds as submitted and there's an attached certificate. We'll need a motion in a so second. Moved. I have a motion by uh, Vice President Chico, seconded by Trustee Baxter. That was actually oh, Trustee was Zia. Zia. Sorry, I got these uh, plastic. I, I can't hear. Uh, so we'll, we'll update the form. We have a uh, motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter on the EEO multiple methods. Any discussion on the item as presented? Seeing here now, we'll take a voice, a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it and the certif certification form is adopted. Moving to item 8.3, this is new and or revised uh, board policy administrative procedures chapter seven, human resources, administrative proce procedure 7170. This is a first reading information item. Uh, no actions required on it, but this is to update uh, as we've been going through with the uh, Community College League of California on our board policies and procedures, this is about remote work. So attached is the um, administrative procedure, which is new, and I don't see an attached board policy, but this is just uh, no corresponding BP. But I guess this is the first time we're sunshining it. 
And this is informational only, no Information no only, no action required. Okay, we'll move on to item 8.4 is employment contracts. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine contracts that are in one action item, and it's a recommendation to the board to approve the employment contracts as submitted, and I can read through them. Uh, number one is Eugene Carbonero, Dean of Career and Technical uh, Education. Uh, the term is July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, and a salary amount of $175,603. Uh, next one is for Paul Creason, Dean of Health and Kinesiology, July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024. And, uh, oh man, my uh, screen keeps moving here. Um, and an amount, sorry, we have to read out the amounts. Oh, thank you. Uh, Paul Creason, an amount of $182,246. Afrina Freeman, Interim Associate Dean, Student Support Services, goes from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023, an amount of $146,844. Uh, Alicia Kirkwood, Interim Associate Vice President, Pacific Coast Campus, July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023, and 191,297. Anthony Pagan, Associate Dean, Career Technical Education, July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, at an amount of 146,844. Uh, next is Brett Peabody, Director of Operations, Head Coach of Football, July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, an amount of $119,763. Next is Jorge Reyes, Interim Director of Operations, Men's and Women's Soccer, July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 term, and an amount of $107,189. Calderon Stewart, Director of Athletics, June 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, at a salary of $146,844. And Javier Villasenor, Interim Dean of Counseling and Student Service Support Services at a term of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024 at a salary of $149,800, sorry, $149,680. Move uh, to approve. Along with health and welfare and life insurance. I can So I wasn't looking and I, I felt I heard yeah. it this way. <laughs> I go with Vice President Chico with the... Yeah. Motion, Trustee Zia with a second. Um, any discussion on the item? Yes, I have, I have a, Baxter? a question and a discussion. I am thrilled to see that Alicia Kirkwood has uh, been uh, appointed interim associate VP of the Pacific Coast Campus. I think it's important to have a, a, an, a strong administrator there. Uh, will she be doing her other duties as well as uh, serving as uh, associate vice president? So the plan would be to backfill the Dean oh, okay. of Student Affairs position because obviously that is a very intense position with right. the responsibilities okay. with student conduct and Title IX and Health Center and mental health services, et cetera, basic needs. So we would probably have to backfill that position okay, as that well. So it does somewhat create a little bit of a domino effect. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a vote. Vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Any abstentions? The ayes have it, and the employment contracts are ratified. Moving on to section nine, academic senate. We have nine point one is we did already. Mm -hmm. uh, nine point two is alignment with chancellor's office memo and directives for AP, uh, IB, CLEP scores for GE Plan A. This is an informational item. Attached are the uh, advanced placement directives for transfer according to the chancellor's office for review. So there's two documents uh, there, and this is for uh, information purposes only. And Dr. Munoz, this will come back for a vote in the future? Or is this just um, notification of the? My understanding is this is an information item, and so it just comes before you as an information item at this time. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'll go now to 9.3, new modified and inactive courses. This is an action item. 
Yeah, it's recommended by the Academic Senate that we uh, uh, we approve the new and modified and active courses effective fall 2023. Distance education uh, attendum are effective summer of 2022. There is new courses for school library media assistant, new non-credit course, school library media assistant, modified courses for integrated college language skills, introduction to academic research, introduction to business philosophy, hybrid and electric vehicle uh, automotives, and inactive is gonna be honors English to literature comp, accelerated proficiency, and a number of distance education courses and communications uh, school library media assistance, nutrition, philosophy. Uh, there is an, a, a detailed attachment, and this is going to need a motion in a second. So moved. Well, second. Motion by Trustee Zia, seconded by Vice President Chico. Any discussions on these new uh, or modified courses? We'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it and the new uh, courses are modified and active or adopted. 9.4 is modified program of study. This is an action item. Uh, this is a recommend the board trustees approve the modified program of studies effective fall 2023. Uh, the modified programs are associate science and welding technology Certificate of Achievement in Welding Technology attaches a, a detailed board report of the programs. I'll need a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on the modified program of study? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it and the program of study has been adopted. Moving on to our next section, academic affairs. 10.1 is English 99 independent direct study. This is an action item. It's recommended the Board of Trustees approve the submission of English 99 to the Chancellor's Office. This is an uh, active in PeopleSoft but never submitted to the California Community College Chancellor's Office for approval. Uh, it's an independent direct study course providing students with variable units. Will allow flexibility for those students in the major to obtain specialized and direct learning objectives attached to the uh, modification and we'll need a, a motion in a second for this so moved. motion by vice president chico second by uh, trustee zia any discussion on this update seeing and hearing none we'll take a voice vote all those in favor say aye aye all those opposed any abstentions ayes have it and it's been adopted Moving to 10.2, new and revised board policy administrative procedures, chapter four, academic affairs. This is the first reading. It's for new and revised uh, board policy administrative procedures, chapter four, board policy 4022, 4105, 4235, or first reading. And as, uh, for informational purposes, the administrative procedures are attached for uh, 4022, 4105, 4235, 4236, 4255. These include course approval, distance education, credit for prior learning, advanced placement credit, dismissal, and readmission. Any discussion on this information item? There's no vote is required. All right. We'll move to section 11, administrative and business services. 11.1 .1 is a resolution uh, intent to approve an easement grant at the PC the Pacific Coast Campus uh, with the City of Long Beach. It's recommended that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution of intent 052522D to authorize a district to grant an easement to the City of Long Beach for the purposes of maintaining and operating underground utilities as submitted. Uh, this is in accordance with the Education Code and an action item that we need. So, I have second. A motion by Vice President Chico, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on the resolution? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it and the easement resolution is adopted. Moving to 11.2, this is a resolution of disposal of district property with collective value under $5,000. Uh, this is an action item and it's recommended 
that the Board of Trustees adopt Resolution 052522E to authorize the Vice President of Business Services or designee to dispose of district property as submitted. There is an attached um, resolution. Any discussion? Oh, sorry, we'll need a motion in a second. Motion, second. Motion by Vice President Chico, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Vice President Drinkwine, anything interesting uh, being disposed of? That no, this is pretty dollars? routine, and there's, um, with that dollar amount, it's not very exciting, but routine. No robots or secret furniture that's really I nice. think the secret furniture robot would be more than $5,000. <laughs> 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 I agree. All right. We'll go to a, a, a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it, and the, res the resolution is adopted. <laughs> yeah, robot furniture. <laughs> We're going to item 11.3, resolution change order authorization under $100,000. Uh, this is a resolution um, that need a motion and a second. It's an action item, and it's... Um, the Board of Trustees to adopt Resolution 052522F to authorize the Vice President of Business Services or designee to execute change orders under $100,000 as submitted. And the attached is a copy of the resolution. Is there a motion or a second? So moved. Motion by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Vice President Chico. Any discussion on the resolution? Seeing and hearing none, we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it and the resolution is adopted. Moving now to item 11.4. This is another action item. It's a resolution on liability and workers' compensation coverage for volunteers. As recommended, the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 052522G, adopting and declaring the purpose of workers' compensation and liability insurance that person, persons authorized to perform volunteer services shall be deemed an employee of the district. Uh, attached is a resolution, and we'll need a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Motion by Vice President Chico, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on the insurance for volunteers? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? The resolution is adopted. Moving to 11.5, the 2021-2022 third quarter budget performance report. This is an information item, but this is the quarterly update of our unrestricted general fund. Um, this is an opportunity to see, and there's also an, a, a, an executive summary attached. So if, for all the budget watchdogs who want to see where our budget is, there's some nice attachments there for you to peruse through. Any discussion on this information item? All right, moving to item 11.6. This is the 2021-2022 CCFS 311Q third quarter financial status report. This is an action item and it's recommended the Board of Trustees uh, approve the third quarter financial status report for Long Beach Community College District and authorize transmittal of the report to the California Community College Chancellor's Office as submitted. Uh, this is an action item to a motion and a second to send to Sacramento. So moved. Motion by uh, Trustee Baxter, second by Vice President Chico. Any discussion on the third quarter financial status report? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice, voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The quarterly report is adopted. Moving to our next item is institutional memberships for 2022-2023, item 11.7. Uh, it's recommend, this is a, uh, an action item. It's a recommendation, recommendation of the Board of Trustees authorize the district institutional memberships for the next fiscal year, 2022, 2023, as submitted. There is an attachment that has all the uh, memberships. It's three pages. Um, and this is an action item. We'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Zia, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on institutional memberships? Yes. I just wanted to um, thank staff for putting such a comprehensive list. I know these um, institutions, hopefully they don't cost us a lot. I know one of them, um, I have the honor and privilege of being nominated by tri <laughs> Trustee Baxter, um, AAUW, American Association of 
um, a university woman, so I am going to be the incoming co-president, and I welcome any of the members um, of the public and our institution to join. It's not only for women, so we welcome you. Thank you. Any other discussion on this agenda item? I, I want to commend um, the district for continuing to be a member of uh, A2 uh, MEND, uh, which is a very important um, outreach for our students and uh, putting on an annual conference. Great, thank you. Any other discussion on institutional memberships? I got one as well, too. Uh, Trustee Blackman? I just want to say how great these are, honestly. Uh, I think from going from different, you know, conferences as well as with other student trustees, um, just seeing that we're still a part of the ACCT, and just, again, with those that provide it for me and other students, I think it's just great that we're an institution that, you know, is willing to actually do these kind of things because there's a lot of institutions that don't. Um, so just, you know, extending my gratitude and my thankfulness for continuing these services because these things mean so much to, um, you know, our, our professors, our faculty, and our students. So. Just want to extend my thanks for that. Awesome. Thank you so much. If there's no further comments. We'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? The memberships are adopted for next year. Moving to item 11.8. This is um, a second reading and action item. This is new and revised board policy administrative procedures, chapter six, business and fiscal services. As recommended, the Board of Trustees um, adopt the, the Board Policy 6150, 6250, 6307, 6330, 6540, 6600, 6620. Uh, attached for information purposes are the administrative procedures, but this covers designation of authorized signatures, budget management, debt issuance and management, purchasing insurance, capital construction, naming facilities, uh, and properties with attached a board policies administrative procedure for each uh, of the listed. We'll need a motion and a second for this one. So moved. Motion by Trustee Zia. Second. Second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on these new policies? This is the second reading. Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? The new policies are adopted. Moving to section 12, 12.1, uh, we have no items for student services. Uh, section 13 is reports of the Board of Trustees. Uh, this is where board members have five minutes to give their uh, monthly report. Trustee Baxter, would you like to start this evening? Thank you, President Dick. Uh, at the um, March meeting, uh, I asked a question and uh, I used the word interesting in my response. As a result of uh, that word, which I never thought anything was wrong with it, at the April meeting, uh, well, uh, I was sent a, a letter from the Black African American uh, Faculty Association. Uh, I wrote a letter of explanation uh, and um, I thought that the issue was dead. I apologized if I offended anyone. Uh, at the April meeting, the letter that uh, the Black Faculty Association sent to me was read without my knowledge, although it did say for publication, uh, and I felt I was blindsided. I felt uh, because my letter said, I'm happy to meet with you, I'm happy to talk with you, that, um, uh, that I should have been told that the letter was read. So now I'm going to read you the letter that I wrote to them on April 18th to the Black Faculty and Staff Association Executive Board. I am saddened that some are troubled by my question and response at the March board meeting. I too am in full support of fostering a culture of care for the most disproportionately impacted groups. I am willing to discuss your concern in person at any time. When I asked about LBCC being a Hispanic serving institution, I thought I was asking for the benefit of my constituency. Some had questioned the proposed allocation of Ms. Scott's generous donation. 
I never intended this question to raise division or, uh, and dissension among various campus constituency. I apologize that my words seem to contradict my commitment and concern for African American students. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to acquaint you with my history. In September of 1970, I was hired as an adjunct instructor in the History and Political Science Department. I must admit that I have never been accused of a microaggression in these 50 years. Since I represent Area 5 for the Long Beach Community College District, in asking my question, I felt there needed to be clarification. And as you have stated in your letter, Dr. Munoz provided that. I even talked with President Untuck after the board meeting about some ideas I had to further help African American students succeed such as meeting individually with African-American students to ask specifically uh, what special tutoring, uh, paid childcare, and or jobs and internships in the community would help them. I'm aware of the equity gap and the college's role in fostering student success. I, gotta, I guess I gotta read faster. I am surprised by your letter because I feel I should have been contacted personally by a member of your board before sending your letter quote, for immediate release. The executive committee seems to have a problem with my response of interesting. Perhaps I chose an inappropriate word, but it could be viewed in light of my larger history of service to LBCC and a caring spirit in reaching out to black students. When I was asked to uh, inaugurate the History of American Women class, 1972, I ensured that all women of color and especially African-American women were included. In 1975, I was asked to speak at the Southern California Church Women United Conference due to my local speech, which included all American women of color. In the 1980s, I served as chair of the scholarship committee for eight years and reached out to donors such as Luther and Will Ruth Williams to provide scholarships specifically for African-American students. In the 1990s, uh, through uh, my oversight of the scholarship program within the LBCC Foundation, more scholarships for African-American students were created, working with LBCCD board member Patricia Laughlin. In each case, I served as an advocate for African-American students through my support of Sankofa and the Amer African-American Scholars Fund, both of which provide scholarships to our black students. I facilitated funding for students at the Pacific Coast campus to attend a conference in Washington, D.C. in 2013. Since 2014, through my leadership in the Helping Homeless LBCC uh, Students Associate Group, 42% of students receiving support are African American. In 2019, I was directed, uh, directly involved in providing funding for a day with Dorothy Pittman Hughes, the underappreciated co-founder of Ms. Magazine. Ms. Pitt Pittman came to LBCC to discuss her role for the women's rights move movement as an African-American female leader. I raised funds for an African-American male student's interview in New York City at Columbia University where he was accepted as a transfer student and graduated with honors in engineering. I've attended two A2 Men virtual conferences to learn about the issues facing African-American male students at community colleges. The Long Beach NAACP recognized my leadership when I was honored at the 2018 uh, Founders uh, Celebration Gala for your contributions, and I quote, and social justice work couple coupled with supporting NAACP missions and goals. Just recently, President Untuck asked me to co-sign the Framework for Reconciliation, and I acknowledged at the time that the college had made some mistakes in hiring and promoting faculty and staff, for, for not hiring and promoting faculty, of sta faculty and staff from unrepresentative areas. In the community I have served for over 20 years on the board of the California Conference of e Equality and Justice, I was the person who suggested using CCEJ as a facilitator for our campus discussion on race relations. I have supported a restorative justice approach to student discipline under their guidelines. I am sorry if I offended anyone or any group. Again, I am happy to meet with you for a conversation 
about this and other concerns. So Thank I, you, Trustee Bass. I'm just going. It'll be a summary, please. No problem. Um, I have uh, been um, uh, approached by. Um, I guess the president, uh, Dr. Jerome Hunt, and I'm going to speak to this group uh, after commencement because this is a very, very busy time. And um, I just wanted to have uh, my uh, response in the record. Uh, unfortunately, there are not a lot of people here, but hopefully people will be listening at home. And um, uh, I, don't have time to give my report, so I'll give a double report in June. All right, we'll go to Vice President Chico. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's been really busy because everybody is, is uh, starting to open up and, and do things, and it's great because we're able to see one another, and many people I, I am meeting for the first time. So I want to thank the Long Beach uh, City College Foundation for the golf tournament that they put on. It was so wonderful. We had so much fun. Uh, I want to thank the foursome that I played with, including uh, Ginny Baxter. I'm not a, a golfer. And so I, uh, I think there's some pictures. There's Jenny right there. So uh, she, she was very helpful and, um, uh, and helped me along the course because I just, I didn't know what I was doing. But it was she fun. has great potential. <laughs> but it was fun. And then while I was there, I had the great pleasure uh, to meet throws coach uh, John McFadden, who was crazy excited to introduce me uh, to his student athlete, Casey Davis. Uh, and Casey was telling me that on Saturday she was going to compete for uh, the state championship. And she won. Yeah, so Casey Davis is the CCCAA state championship, and she is also the first female athlete at LBCC to win the women's shot put state championship. So congratulations to Casey. And she looked fabulous while doing it too. So kudos to her. Um, so I also wanted to uh, mention that I went to the Long Beach firefighter, uh, firefighters recruit graduation. That's always really impressive. I took that picture. Uh, they demonstrate there's fires, flames, and everything. And so it's just a, a reminder of the training, uh, the skilled uh, uh, first responders that we have here in, in Long Beach. Uh, who protect us, and so uh, that was great to see new recruits coming in. Um, we had Harvey Milk Day and pride, raising, pride flag raising here on campus, but in the morning, at 9 in the morning, I also did the same thing in Signal Hill. Uh, Mayor Keir Jones uh, acknowledged and, and recognized uh, Harvey Milk Day and also raised the pride flag. So it was an early day of all pride, and it was fantastic. I also attended the ASB banquet. It was great to see Ava Cross in her element, uh, and so, uh, so many of her cabinet members um, uh, that had so many wonderful things to say about her and her leadership. So it was great to see that. Lavender graduation was wonderful. Um, uh, there was, uh, I think, Ginny and uh, Trustee Baxter and President Entuk were, were there. And um, there were, it was, the, the energy that was in there was just so beautiful. And there was so much pride. Um, I can't wait for the other affinity uh, events that we have over the next week. I think that is all of it. Oh, one last thing. Yes, thank you, Dario. Um, I want to invite everybody to Catalina Pride. If you know, uh, Catalina Island is part of my district. Uh, last year, they whipped up a real quick uh, pride walk. There was about 20 of us that walked from the Wrigley stage to the casino and back. This year, it's going to be a little bit 
bigger. We've planned a little bit more. I'm happy uh, that Long Beach City College will have a table to uh, provide information and resources about uh, classes and, and what we offer here. But uh, I, I just want to support uh, Catalina Island. It's going to be a small pride celebration, but it's going to be fierce. Uh, hope to see uh, people there. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Motlulu, can you hear us? Absolutely. Are you ready? I hope you guys can all hear me. Uh, so on April 28th, I attended the Mayor's Fund, um, the uh, fundraising event for his education fund at MOLA. I've had several ACCT meetings over the past month. Um, that organization really deserves a lot of respect. A lot of the uh, roll up your sleeves in the trenches type of work that they do on behalf of um, community colleges all over the country. It's incredible the timing that goes into what uh, the Association of Community College Trustees does. We had a special meeting on the 16th, and then this past Monday I attended the um, uh, My Monday Blacks Leadership Academy class. Um, I would like to thank uh, Trustee Chico for pinching for me at a couple of events, especially the one this past Sunday. Um, Signal Hill is now in my trustee area, and I was unable to attend, so I appreciate her going back to her former trustee area to uh, uh, represent LBCC on my behalf. Uh, also, I just want to apologize. I know I spoke to um, Robert Rodetta at head RSVP to the classified uh, banquet last Friday, and I called him and told him I would not be able to attend. Um, I also was not able to attend the ASB banquet, so um, just the unexpected turn of events with my daughter's softball has really uh, created a lot of schedule conflicts in the past few days, so if you know, you know. But uh, thank you to everybody for your grace and your patience and understanding. Uh, usually if I was repeated some things because I intend on being there, so it has pained me to not be able to attend some of these events. Um, I would like to uh, wish everybody a great year end. Good luck with wrapping up everything, finals and papers. Uh, commencement is on the horizon and we did it, we're all excited. So I really want um, everyone to continue to just look towards that uh, great finish line. And also to uh, share with all of you that, you know, we hurt together and we worry together. And there have been so many tragedies that have happened and affected so many of our communities. And it's important that we do have uh, time to heal and talk to each other and just hug each other give everybody space and just say, look, you know, people are hurting in different ways. Asian community, African American community, Latino community. There's so many of our students that um, have to internalize all that grief and our employees. So just, you know, you're not alone and we hear you. Um, other than that, I just want to thank everybody because I know this is another challenging year, but we're almost at the end. So let's get through it strong and let's enjoy all these years Thank you, Trustee Marlou. Uh, Trustee Zia. Ms. Dario, can you um, start the video, please? Uh, I don't know why there's one minute on there left. I think I, the clock says one minute, yeah. So I'm going to um, share a video of uh, one of our students who's been one of uh, Trustee Baxter and my um, pride and joy. And this is John Salcedo. Thank you. 
one each. And I'm with you here today, if it wasn't for your help, Sunny Zia, Jamie Baxter. The year was 2015. I was living out of my car, had nowhere to go. I was taking night classes at LBCC. And my car broke down. At night, I had to spend the night. Camouflage myself in the backseat so the cops wouldn't see me. And I woke up with a parking ticket the next morning. And that's, that was the breaking point for me. I was about to drop out of school. And luckily I saw a story in the school paper where Sunny Zia was on the cover reaching out to homeless students. And I gotta be honest with you, I, I didn't expect a response back. That was my last Hail Mary. I was on my way out, never looking back to LBCC. And within 48 hours, it seemed like I had a check for uh, two scholarships uh, to put a deposit for a rental house. So I was able to move in before the holidays. I was able to finish my transfer degree. So uh, going in fall of 2020, I got into film therapy school. And I just graduated. I never thought I'd ever be in a place like this. And I now know what they mean. Nobody could ever take away your education. So I see with my education, my journey, I learned about racial covenants and racial ideology, terms I didn't know what they meant or even existed. I didn't know that the city of Lakewood was built for whites only, but it had racial covenants in the year 1959. So even though a Mexican-American fought during World War II, it would not be able to fight to get a house in Lakewood. That to me was crazy, so I ended up writing a script, and it got selected for a production scholarship from the Hollywood Foreign Press. So we just tested the movie at the Carpenter Center at Custom Long Beach, and that was really exciting, so uh, we're ready to get this movie out to the world, and I just want to let you know that you guys are in the movie credits. Mm -hmm. I wanted to thank the Helping Homeless LBCC students and the Robinette Military Veterans Scholarship. You guys are in the credits. Jimmy Baxter, Sunny Zia, you're in the credits. Because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. So, the plan is to submit today to the statewide CSU Media Arts Festival where all 23 CSUs in the state of California will compete for the best film. And I feel that we have a strong chance of getting in and winning the best film. We have a cast that is dynamic. We have a dress that was donated by HBO season two before you with other props. So this is a very exciting time, and I hope that I can help other LBCC students to discover a new creative path. That film directing school is just around the corner at Custom Long Beach. But then you also don't need to be a film director to work in the movie industry. And hopefully I can help uh, get that. So thank you. Thank you, Sunny Zia. Thank you, Jane Baxter. Thank you to the school paper. And thank you, LBCC. Have a good meeting. Take care. God bless you all. Darius, since I have a couple minutes left, if you can also show the pictures. Um, this was the student that I spoke about last time, Nicholas Alvarado, and he got a scholarship after we um, gave the report. Thank you, Dr. Munoz, for supporting. Thank you, Paul Kamensky and the Board of Governors. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. And if you can go to the next picture. That's his mom, his proud mom, single mom, and she's very appreciative. Now he's going to be able to go and fulfill his dream of becoming, um, uh, being in the aerospace industry and presenting at the one of the prestigious IAC conferences. Um, if you can go to the next one. This is um, what John Salcedo's credits, the movie screening on May 14 that we were able to attend, Dr. Baxter and I, and then if you can go to the next one. This is John and his... Um, debut. It was an amazing uh, opportunity. And then the next slide, that's his um, 
mom and his partner, when uh, he was one of the first um, veteran um, uh, students that we were able to support that was also in, uh, a member of the LBGTQIA um, community and I was proud to be able to support him and see him thrive in this industry and live up uh, to his dreams and aspirations and get such great accolades. And that's his proud mom and his proud uh, partner. And uh, uh, we're, at, we're at five minutes time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Uh, I think I have the last report. Uh, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, very busy last month. Uh, Really want to say thank you to Dr. Munoz um, and Vice President Chico. We uh, presented in New York uh, at the AACC uh, National Convention about the Framework for Reconciliation and has a very well attended event. Uh, just in the last few days, we did a pride flag raise here at the LAC campus. Last year we did it at the PCC campus. It was very well attended. Uh, Dr. Hunt gave a great speech uh, there. We had a number of students um, Really appreciate everyone's support in making that event happen. I uh, attended the Lavender graduation uh, last night with uh, Trustee Baxter and Vice President Chico was there and it was our first time of doing it in person. Uh, it was really some very heartfelt words from the students. Uh, you know, it was a relatively small group, but it was an opportunity, you know, to walk across the stage and be at the mic and be able to, to share and uh, so many family and friends uh, were there. It was a really nice event uh, last night. Um, was able to attend the uh, classified employee appreciation lunch at, at PCC. It was really nice to see everybody. We did have a too long of a line for food, but it was a, a good time to chat and catch up with people. And it was really nice to see everybody in person because some people we hadn't seen uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, and then also that we did a celebratory lunch um, on May 10th with the uh, accreditation steering team. Everyone that was involved and drafting the, the documents and the presentations and preparing for the interviews. Uh, it was really nice to sit down and see the faces behind the stacks and stacks of paperwork uh, that we went through. And so it was really nice uh, recognition and great to be able to get a positive uh, academic review and uh, for accreditation. And we'll get our final documents uh, next month uh, in June from the accreditation entity. Uh, and I think with that is and then the items I, I attended, and uh, I know we have a very long closed session still before us. Um, we do have uh, item 12 point, uh, sorry, 13.2 is board committee reports. I don't know if we had, do we have a board committee? No, but I would like to make a point of privilege if I may, sir. Sure. Um, we do have a birthday on the dais tonight, and so I would like to acknowledge that it's Vice President Drinkwine's birthday. I forgot to mention that in my report. So, just want to say happy birthday to Vice President Trinquine. Congratulations. Yeah. Awesome. We'll go to item 13.2 uh, board committee reports. Do we have any reports? No. None at this time. Item 14.1, public comments on non-agenda items. Do we have any additional public comments? No requests. All right, so this will move into our closing of open session. We have a second closed session that we'll go into uh, and adjourn from this, but um, you know, on this day after a very um, uh, treacherous and um, sad day in America, uh, we wanna adjourn this evening and uh, memory of the, I believe, 19 children and two teachers uh, that lost their lives in Texas yesterday. Um, I also have a list of, and we'll, we'll put, we'll get all the names to put in the minutes uh, to Michelle, but we also have, uh, we did recognize, but we'll, we did lose Judy Powell, who was a trustee for, uh, I think, Area th 3, uh, Belmont Shore. Is that Harriet? Ibbotson and Janice. Janice Grant. Both uh, Janice Grant and Harriet Ibbotson, both alumni who were very giving to LBCC. So we'll, we'll adjourn tonight in memory of all of those souls, but please join me in a, a moment of silence as we remember them.
This concludes our regular board meeting. The next meeting of the Board of Trustees will be held on June 22nd, 2022. Closed session at 4.30, open session at 5.30. It is currently 10 o'clock on the dot that we are adjourning back into closed session. And we'll be back out afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.
We ready, Dario? Okay, we are reconvening from closed session at approximately 11.35 p.m. Uh, we have no reportable action out of closed session. The next regular meeting of the Board of Trustees will be held on June 22nd, 2022. Closed session at 4.30 p.m. and open session at 5.30 p.m. This concludes our meeting. We're adjourning tonight at 11.36 p.m. Good night, everyone. Thank you again. Take care.